We're live. Jackie Francois. Matthew Fred. Do you know when I first met you, I kept calling you Jackie Franco? Yeah. I have people call me Jacques, even though that's not how I spell my name. I don't spell it with a Q U. Do you really remember me calling you Jackie Franco? Or are you just like, I can see no, how someone did. would do that? No, you What was funny is, I guess I got it wrong, and then my wife's like, it's Jackie Francois. I'm like, no, it's not Cameron, because I called her that, and she said it was Jackie Franco, which is the exact opposite of what happened. I thought you just thought it was funny. Franco. I have people call me like Jacque and, you know, so Jacqueline. So. Jackie Frank Francois Angel? So Francois is my middle name now. Oh. Just because people Same still- Same thing with my wife. She took last name middle name. Yeah. Yeah. So no hyphen, just Angel's my last name. It's a great last name. Dude. It's I'm, really good. I married well, man. You know? Bobby Angel, what a champion. <laughs> what his initials are B A. <laughs> Literally B A. So yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, well it's good to have you. Thank you for Thanks. flying in. How are you? Yeah. Doing well. Yeah, it's fall. I came in in the fall leaves. It's very exciting because Dallas is very brown right now. And so all the grass dies in yeah, Dallas. it's still green right now, but it dies and it's very sad. But there's something about the grass that goes brown for yeah. some reason. Yeah, it's not California. It's a different type of grass. Yes. Than here. Oh, it doesn't die here? I don't think so. It stays green. <laughs> really? But there's a Even type of grass in like Atlanta. It's a specific type of grass, I think, in winter. Neil's looking at me incredulously. <laughs> that goes, it just goes brown. It's really ugly. It is. Ve- it's I think it's like not... crab grass is what it's called. It's so cool that you knew that. Yeah, it's like a special grass, and then it comes back to life magically in the spring. Amazing. Yeah. Um, where were you before Dallas? We were in California, Orange County. That's where I was born and raised. Right. Bobby's from That's Florida. That's where I met you in um, Ventura. When I was a youth minister up in Ventura. Buena, Sam Buenaventura. Okay. Bonaventure. Oh. I, I know. I did not know. I just thought of Jim Carrey. <laughs> Ace, right? Ace, Ace Ventura. Ventura. Yeah, I didn't realize... Because obviously a lot of the cities in California are named after saints. Yeah. San Francisco was St. Francis of Assisi. Our dang capital is Sacramento, Blessed Sacrament. And Los Angeles is Our Lady, Queen of Angels. It's literally... Wow. Like, so California needs to be taken back for Jesus. Amen. But Ventura is Buena Ventura, San Buena Ventura, Bonaventure. That's amazing. Yeah. Big fan of Bonaventure. So I met you back it. in the day when I was a... We youth minister, yes, and you and Cameron right. came. In. I remember the moment you guys came in that church we were rehearsing, and that's right. Because that was about that's sixteen years ago, Jackie. Not crazy. We were just children. Just I remember because my t- wife and I had just got married a couple of months before, and okay. we were staying at, at Kate and Aaron's. Yeah, yeah. And they had rats in the walls. Oh, so we showed up and like, yeah, just heads up. There's Temple, rats in Templeton the walls. Templeton was just running around. Yeah, and we were like laying in bed, hearing scratches. <laughs> it was terrifying. <laughs> What were you Happy doing? Honeymoon. What were you doing back then? I was a youth minister. At that parish? At that parish. For yeah. how long? Only a year. And then I felt like God was calling me to do, just through some mentors, like I was called to do full-time <coughs> speaking and I was writing music. And so I got signed mm. to a label and uh, yeah, I've just started doing full-time speaking and singing because I was like, Lord, how are you going to take, like I I love ministry and youth ministry especially because Youth and like middle schoolers, I love, they have no filter. They literally will tell you if they hate you and like you're ugly to your face. And I love them. Just like YouTube commenters. I, yeah, just Not like YouTube. Not all of them, but most but, of them. But pre, yeah, pre-social media. Like I, they have <laughs> you no You got used to social media there in filter. middle school. They're so great. So yeah. I love ministry. And that's where I had my real conversion. Wait, hang on. You went from they call you ugly and stuff and you loved it? I No, I love because they are so brutally honest. Like I literally one time was giving a talk and God kind of pointed out this girl to me, like not shown a light on her, but I just kept looking. I just saw her body language and how she was responding to my chastity mm-hmm. talk. <laughs> and a core member came up to me and was like, she hated your talk. I was like, I knew it. Like I could see, but I, I also had this like word that it was like, this girl doesn't have a father. Wow. As I'm just looking, it was like, this girl doesn't have a father. And uh, so I go and I, I go to talk to her with this core member. I say, hey, you know, what do you think of the talk? She's like, oh, well. I thought it was interesting, you know, rolled her out, you know, mm-hmm. and then come to find out she had a one year old child and she was 15 years old and come to find out her father had left her mother when she was. And then she just her mom, she's like, my mom is married to a gold digger. You know, but I saw it. It was like God yeah. just show, But she was just so honest. Like, I hated your talk because you're talking about chastity. And I have a one year old baby here, you know, and I'm 15 years old. So but I appreciate that. I love when people are honest and real. I, I would take that <coughs> any day of the week over someone who kind of pretends hey. to have it all together yeah, and is... T- I, I you know. agree. I really love... I don't speak a lot these days. Um, 
to teenagers. I just did recently again. I just love them. Yeah. I feel affection for them. Yeah. Especially the weird ones. Because I (laughs) was slash am the weird one. Like I I was the kid who was dyeing his hair and wearing heavy metal t shirts and really what color was your hating everybody. I did it once I, I dyed it purple once. Yes. I'm not proud of that. Yeah. All right. This is before, but you know what's cool is since like we're roughly the same age. Yeah. We probably uh Everyone in like the late nineties, early two thousands went through a at least the dudes did, like a bleach tip mm-hmm. oh, yeah. shell necklace oh, guitar playing. Shell. It Shut sure up. it sure happened. Bobby, Amazing. my husband, also had the bleach. He was also he did not. a swimmer. Who he's a swimmer. But like Bobby, when I think of Bobby, I think yeah. one of the manliest men I've ever met. He's just so cool and manly. He so is. the fact that he has had bleached hair and, and a had shell to necklace. shave his legs for swimming. Sorry, yeah. Bobby, I'm telling the world. <laughs> what I else? mean, that's what, what guys do. <laughs> Why is. did we ever think that was cool? They would uh, actually put a big rubber thing around your head that was perforated uh-huh. and then pluck the hair out and you'd sit there and then they would paint. Neil is looking again, incredulous. You should find an image of this just to show people what it looks well, like. Well, I was looking for you with Robert, <laughs> Well, really you could probably it. find it. Oh my it. gosh, yeah. Yeah, well, I posted that image recently of me in my like wet oh, yeah, suit. That was definitely bleached hair, dude. I, I, the puka shell thing. Right. So I the went what? to I, the puka shells. Oh, that's what they're called. I didn't dude. Know that was Come on, bro. Like Sorry. the surfer culture, Not from you know, California. Oh, pukas. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I went to World Youth Day in 2000 with Pope John Paul. I was like, me too. 15. Did you really? Yes, 17. Oh my gosh, we were probably say hello, next year. We yeah. probably were. Um, and I came back with three boyfriends um, from that <laughs> from trip. From different countries <laughs> when did. email was just beginning to be a thing, <laughs> right? Like AOL, you know. Um, but Internet yeah, one of them was like big on the the puka shells and the bleach tips. So it totally reminds me of like 2000. Oh my yeah. Gosh. Actually, I think two of them, maybe all three of them. <laughs> Oh. What do you mean all three of them? You actually found three men to converse yeah, with. I did not care about Jesus at this point in my life. I just wanted ah. boys. So how, old, was, how old were you? Is it okay if I, I do that? I know women get weird. How old am I now? I've asked women how old they are and they want to punch oh, I me. I don't care. Okay. I, I'm I didn't think 38. I'll be yes, I was born in 83. Yeah. I was born in 83. Yeah. I know. No, you're not 38. Unless you're 39. Well, I'm this turning year. my birthdays in December. I'm th- That's amazing. <clears throat> yeah. We're both 83 babies. That's cool. Yeah. So that was the era. <clears throat> Yes. We were coming of age right as Britney and Backstreet and NSYNC. That was like 98. I had a cassette tape with NSYNC on one side and Britney. Or maybe that it was Backstreet. That is amazing. Yeah. 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 yeah My I, human formation came from Oprah. It happened. Oh I came home God. every... <laughs> I mean, sorry. Oh, I don't mean to crap on Oprah. No, but. no. I came home every day at three o'clock, turn on Oprah. I, I, I specifically remember one episode where a psychologist was on and there was a husband and wife and the wife and her kids. And the wife was like, I love my kids more than my husband. And the psychologist was like, no, no. Like your primary relationship is with, on Oprah. On Oprah. Go Oprah. I was like, ooh, attachment theory. Like, I was like, this is triangulation. Right? Yeah. Like, now I'm like, I, and so I remember these things as like a 10 year old coming home and watching. Oprah. But that my human formation was Saturday Night Live and Oprah because my parents had, um, you know, great, you know, great influence. All right. <laughs> they didn't care. But I couldn't watch The Simpsons. So is, I could watch SNL, but not The Simpsons. Did you have that too? Well, first of all, is it weird to you that me, in Australia, on the other side of the planet, is so impacted by American culture. Yeah. It's so strange. Like, most of the movies we watch, most of the music we listen to, it was all American stuff. Yeah. It's so bizarre, isn't it? Well, when... Like, imagine if all the music people listen to here or movies they watch were from Australia. Wouldn't that be weird? I know. Bobby and I went to New Zealand, and they're like, oh my gosh, do you know Taylor Swift? Yeah, it's great, yeah. Holy Um, crap, that was a great accent. Keep going. Okay, let me tell you. Um, It's because one of my favorites, um, her name is Brooke Fraser. So, yeah. So, like, in Australia, you guys say, like, whatever summer you know but yeah. like in new zealand it's a bit more like sing-songy. i have never heard an american do no as good. you totally have I you t- just said no no perfectly. like no i american listen to a lot of new zealanders Neil, you know you try to say no in australian accent <laughs> i don't want to now. okay <laughs> but yeah like new zealand is a bit more like sing-songy yeah. you know yeah so uh, <laughs> totally. um but bobby and i went to new zealand and they really were like oh my gosh you guys are from california yeah. you know do you know taylor swift and all that stuff and i'm like we Think of Lord of the Rings. So Bobby and I got to go to Hobbiton. And so of cool. course. I've been there too. It's wonderful. And, and we're like, we think you guys are so cool. And your accents yeah. in Australia. You know, like, yeah, we just yeah, think yeah. you guys are so cool. And they're like, really? And yeah. they're cute because they're like, oh, the North Island is like crap, you know? Like the South <laughs> Island is much better. That well. Like better, you know? Wow. Um, so, yeah. You could do a better New Zealand accent than I could. Well, I try, I try to do Australian, but it always turned into New Zealand. Yeah. I just had awesome 
I have to learn um, my but Australian. It's funny, awesome. right? Because I mean, Australia is probably more prominent than New yes. Zealand, and it's, it's, as far as like yeah. TV shows and actors and things like that. So it's strange that you would get the New Zealand accent down. I First. think it's because I'm better at the, uh, like, Italian, too. Like, I was in Italy. <laughs> a lady asked me, I said, uh, like, a che ora la mezza? And she starts speaking to me in Italian, like, ah, io sono americana. Like, I don't, like, non capisco italiano. You know, like, I don't understand. But I like the, uh, it's it's the inflection. I'm a musician. I know what That's what I was so going to say. As a musician, you kind of. Y- yes, you have an ear for these things. But not all of them. Some accents I really don't do a great job at it. i got to tell people this one more time because people in the comment section are getting confused. The reason <laughs> Australia is upside down is because if Australia drew the maps instead of Europeans, uh, that's how it would have looked since we have no reference point to what is actually north and what is actually south. Interesting. Right? It's not okay. like we know what north is. We know what north is because Europeans wrote the maps. So people in it who are from Australia <laughs> keep getting offended. Could you please turn it upside turn down? It. And then I have faithful YouTube commenters who explain. From episode, you know, five <laughs> months ago, he ex- that, that's when we did it. So yeah. everyone watching right now, please school everybody who's unsure why that's upside down. Yeah. Amazing. So you went to New Zealand. Went to New Zealand. When? I was, or Abby, our first was t- seven months old, I think. Taking a seven month old on a fourteen hour plane ride. Being there. It 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 happened. She was it wasn't as bad as if she were like walking. That toddler age, just to encourage anyone who has a toddler between ages of one and three is a rough flying age and a rough taking them to mass age. Whew. One to three is hard. Yeah. How would you what advice would you give to new mum Jackie about how to handle and love and live? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. Like how, how, what advice would you give to her about what to do with the young kids? I would say something I've learned recently. There's there's a uh, podcast called The Place We Find Ourselves. Love and it. Okay. And this guy talks about um, the attachment theory and the mm. six, I think it's like his second episode, like the six things every child needs. And not only do you listen to that as like, <laughs> was I given those things as a child for my parents, like attunement and um, like repair, like did my parents yeah. apologize? So there were some things, one of the things that he said in there that really was like, oh, he's like, children need to know that you can handle their big emotions. Mm-hmm. And I've always kind of thought as a parent, like, I feel like the goal of parenthood is to stay pretty evenly. You have to learn how to be evenly keeled when your kids are going nuts, mm-hmm. but it's hard. They, it's ooh, really hard. Like my husband is the most evenly killed person and he's like, I've never confess the sin of anger until I had children. Yeah. <laughs> because they, they're, tam- but. It's not just their te- temper and. Tantrums, yeah. It's not just that. It's also what you believe about yourself as they're giving it back to you. Like right. you're feeling like a failure. Yeah. And that makes you angry and scared. And so then you react. Yeah. And sometimes you're like, you should like thinking you should know better. I've taught you better. Or mm. um, just like, ah, nobody cares about me like you know there's just all that stuff that's going Mm -hmm. on so when when he said like children need to know that you can handle their big emotions i was like ah Mm -hmm. yes like i'm not going to be moved by your massive tantrums and i i don't know if this is a thing but i realized in my kids in their phases in the toddler phase there's three stages this these are the tantrum phase where Mm -hmm. they go from you know you can like take a toy from a baby and they don't care but then there's a stage where you take it away and they're like and they you know they lose it so it's like the tantrum phase the meltdown phase is when you're you literally think your kids are demonically possessed (laughs) you know that's like a stage you're like whoa yeah like they just i wanted to put your shoes on and you literally do we need to like get holy water you said you wanted to kill mommy (laughs) (laughs) like their eyes start shaking you know like i have had yeah, you're like, oh, all right, okay, this is like the meltdown phase. And the last phase is like the defiant. It's like mm-hmm. the last hurrah before the age of reason where they start losing it. And like, my sweet little boy, Johnny, you know, I'm like, Johnny, can you? He's like, no, never get. I'm like, oh, the defiance. So mm-hmm. I'm like, it's the last stage before the reason kicks in. Until then, they're just like little drunk people. So, yeah. yeah. So that would be your advice to young mom, Jackie, and other young moms is just yeah. try to find a way to not react to their reacting like it's not personal like don't take it personally they're just having big emotions and it's okay just breathe like this is it's not about you this is about these kids go through these phases and they Mm -hmm. and they don't have the part of their brain yet it's not Mm -hmm. developed yet where they can reason with their emotions so they're either 100 percent happy or 100 percent angry that's why they like (laughs) they could be throwing a full bone tantrum you're like want a cookie and they're like oh cookie yeah yeah. you know so 
for me, I wish. Yeah, I feel like I've it's gotten better by child number four now because mm-hmm. my second, her her tantrums were off the charts, and I. I think the other <sighs> thing that we don't realize as parents is uh, it's not necessarily a reflection on how you're parenting them, right? Every, every uh, and kid when you is have different. when you have your first child, you you I don't know about you, but I had this tremendous pressure. Like I got to get this right mm-hmm. so he doesn't grow up and be whatever X Y or Z. And so whenever I would see things that I didn't like, I'd get really worried and really anxious and try to like alter right. how I was parenting them. <laughs> but I really just at some point, once you start seeing that in children, as you say, you see the stages mm-hmm. and you see that things end up well. So yep. long as you are loving, repairing relationships when whatever, that it's everything's fine. Like yes. It's really actually fine. And I didn't know that it was fine. Yeah. Like when my kid would do a tantrum at mass, I'm like, now he's going to become like an atheist drug dealer. <laughs> I never thought that. but <laughs> And everyone's judging you that's the for thing being you a think horrible too. parent. It's like when it's your first child and if your child is throwing a fit, you feel that judgment from other people. And maybe you're judging yourself thinking, if I were a better parent, then this child would act the way that little Johnny over there is acting, not realizing that different children have different temperaments and different parents who have significantly different temperaments. And that's okay as well. Yes. And then I had a parent once tell me she has six kids and she said, I thought I was a perfect parent for the three kids. And then number four came and I was like, really? And so I had my number two through crazy tantrums like kicking screaming and she's just a really deep feeler Mm -hmm. and now she's great she's so beautifully sensitive she's so helpful she's Mm. six and a half i oh she's such a good kid my number four is like you know taking a toddler to mass it's like taking a squirrel i mean it's like Mm -hmm. having a squirrel but she's like an angry squirrel, like volatile. <laughs> she's the kind of kid when you pick her up, she does the floppy thing yeah. and starts screaming. Like, I'm like, oh boy. And and every kid, like my some of my other kids didn't do that. Yes, that's right. So her, that kid is going to be, you know, we're going to hopefully direct those passions. So uh-huh. she'd be a great saint. Of course she And um, like, no one's going to tell her what to do. You know, she's yes. going to be like, don't tell me what to do, which is great. But right now as a toddler. Exactly. That's what I've heard. That the, oh the, the kind of, um, gosh. The, the, the temperament or the, the traits in your children that, you know, you want them to have as adults are the most annoying when they're young. Right. That kind of independence and... Ooh, a strong will. Yeah. Oh, boy, number four. Well, see, that's the other thing, right? Because yeah. you and Bobby are both strong-willed folks, would you say? Bobby's not. He's he's pr- really chill. I mean, so he's a So my wife and I are like both big personalities and we're both very choleric Yeah, when you way. guys are like, Cameron is the extrovert, I'm like, what? Like, cause is that you're... before you met me or what? Well, oh, before you met her, I mean? Well, you just... The, it's funny because you seem like you're the yeah. extra, and when you're on stage and everything, yeah. and then when people find out that your wife is, they're like, "What, oh, dear God? Yeah, <laughs> what's that house like? <laughs> Come and see." Um, but yeah, Bobby's like super chill. Oh, that um, must be nice. And then I'm like <laughs> My the wife sang- would love that. Yeah, the sanguine choleric, and so yeah, I I can have. Thankfully, Bobby is like he gets stuff done though, so he's a he motivates me when I'm my like lazy sanguine. Okay. person because i'm like a procrastinator i'm like melancholic choleric my wife's textbook choleric it's unbelievable yeah unbelievable but she's a kind of choleric that gets along really well with powerful women yeah i know your wife is super ch- like she's, she's very easy going she's ama- and she's very humble so yeah. she doesn't feel shown up or threatened by anybody well, she's i've in, never she's seen integrated. her integrated that that's okay. like the beautiful thing about when someone is integrated versus when they're like disintegrated Acting out of wounds yeah and the pride i mean pride in any of those temperaments is bad i mean because i've met melancholics all over. you know like this because a really good integrated... can we just stop for a second and break down each of these temperaments yes. for those okay. who are unaware okay. you doing which by me? the way there's a book called the temperament god gave you and then there's one like the temperament god gave your spouse the temperament god gave your children which i think is fascinating it's fascinating for your friends like to know your in your friends and your relationships and even in your family members it just starts making sense so yeah. Okay, the more extroverted temperaments are sanguine and choleric. The sanguine, and they all have the good and the bad. So the goal is to be integrated. So sanguines are the life of the party. So the good thing is they're fun. You know, they're life of the party. The bad thing is sanguines can be the center of attention, right? They can be the attention hogs. Um, Cholerics are great because they are like the go-getters. They get stuff done. CEOs, saints. Yeah, the bad thing is like... Mm. they are, bo- they can be bossy. And mm-hmm. actually, if you were a child, like if my uh, eight-year-old, the six-year-old's already calling her bossy. I'm like, great. She will be a CEO of a company. Mm-hmm. You know? But if you've been called bossy, you have choleric in you, you know. So choleric is good because they're very logical, get stuff done. The bad thing is they can be control freaks and, you know. 
So the melancholic phlegmatic are the more introverted ones. Um, and melancholic, the good thing about melancholics is they're really uh, reflective. Yeah. They are like my husband. He's so, he's like the philosopher. And even right. our six and a half year old, she is such the little philosopher. Mm -hmm. She asks amazing questions like, did God create Mary? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, but she, he, she's his mother. How could God create his own mother? I'm like, she's six and a half. And she asked this like a year ago. It's beautiful. But she's a little philosopher. The bat, the, the, the <laughs> non-integrated melancholics can be very Debbie Downer. Yeah. Oh boy. And if you've ever met one of those, oh, it's like, I can be like that. Or the Eeyore, like, Oh, oh I can totally be me. like that. You know, I think less and less, but I, yeah, I for sure. Hopefully less well, what's funny is when I first, uh, you go, one more though, yeah, before one I more. tell phlegmatic. you that. Phlegmatic. So the phlegmatic is the person who's like super chill. go with the flow, uh -huh. chill. The bad thing is they don't ever get stuff done. Right, so right. I, I never, my, my always hard temperament was cholerics, like who just boss the heck out of people. Uh -huh. Right. Um, but I, I met some phlegmatics that like, man, it's like, get some stuff done, dude. You know, so that to, mm -hmm. it's just the goal is to be integrated and humble and have yeah. vir virtue. I don't so. know about you. I know some people don't like these kind of ideas because if they feel like it boxes them in or something, right, which right. makes you a, no, I'm just joking, <laughs> some kind of temperament. But I actually found it really liberating, really liberating yeah. when, I first, when I first went through this. Um, I actually, when I first did the test, I was convinced I was sanguine. Like sanguine choleric. Which I think people would probably assume because you're very life of the party when you're in front of people. Eh, you're very good. I think so. I don't know if it's less over over the years. If it was like, if it was me and Cameron and you and Bobby, yeah, I'd probably be more effusive. But when yeah. there's like, say, 10 or 11 people, then everything in me starts to retreat inside my head. Right. I start to retreat inside of myself. Well, and then, and then for me, like <laughs> I am... A sanguine, I'm very outgoing, but I don't like a lot of people. Like I am a quality time person. So mm -hmm. then you go into the love languages, yeah. which I also Here love. Here we go. Yay. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I, I would much rather have less people and deep conversations Hundred than a massive party so, with yeah. all these superficial conversations. Here's a Ooh, question. I can't stand it. Would anyone admit to wanting to be among a ton of people with superficial conversations? Any human being ever I, right yeah, now I on the planet? I have friends who love... Big parties, I hate the, I hate them. But they wouldn't phrase it like that. They wouldn't be like, I just no. love superficial conversations with a ton of people. Right. So what right. would they I, say? I think they just like, that's where they get, ener they're like energized by that. And I'm not. I yeah. I don't like, I don't know, the quality time person in me like cringes. Even if it's a room full of people I love. Yeah. Like all people I love, I'm like, I can't spend time with you, like good time with you. Yeah. So. To me, it kill it like kills me. Like when I'm at big conferences with a lot of my friends, but mm. I only have like a minute with them. It's like, hey, how you doing? Oh, good, good. I'm like, Ugh, <sighs> like dying inside. So, I'd rather have two or three people at my house me or too. at a coffee shop. Has that changed as you've gotten older? Um, I kind of. I think maybe, it, but I st I still always like deeper yeah. conversations. Even when you were I, like 17 at World Youth yeah, Day. Yeah, I. St <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe post conversion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. I think back then I I wasn't as deep interiorly, so maybe I was just like, you're cute, you're breathing, let's date. Oh my <laughs> okay. gosh, you know. Well, Carrie Beckman, so. who we both know, <laughs> said to me once, she's like, I'm so sorry, there is no way you're sanguine. I'm like, yeah, no, I've done the test. She's like, I'm telling you, you're definitely melancholic. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do this test just to shut her up. She you, was right. Yeah, yeah, she was right, hundred percent. Interesting. So, so I don't know what that was. You thought that you, you didn't realize you were more introverted? And it's hard, right? Because you have people who are a fan of these tests saying you don't ever change. And so, okay, but maybe you do. Or maybe I just really like the idea of being sanguine. Like, mm. uh, you know, and you gravitate towards that and you answer those questions subconsciously what you want to have the result be. And then I have a friend who says that if Jesus was like kind of like the perfect integration of all all of them, then as we become more like Jesus, we kind of come closer to that middle. Like, mm. oh, that's an interesting proposition too. Yeah. But obviously as you get older, I think you also realize what's more important in life. So mm -hmm. I, I think when people are younger, they have a massive group of friends. And as you get older, that kind of whittles down till you realize like, I, I have a close group of friends that really matter in my life. Like, I don't know if you've noticed that about your life, but for mm -hmm. me, you know, you just have like 
a lot of friends when you're in high school and college and then it starts whittling down to the people in your life who are like, no, these are yeah. like, I don't have time. Like, I don't no, have dude. time to have well, he, 12 best friends. I don't want to offend everybody in Steubenville who's ever said hi to me, but like there's a thousand <laughs> amazing Catholics, more, 10,000 amazing Catholic families here yeah. in Steubenville. And everybody says this who lives here. It's like, you just can't be friends with everybody. Back when I lived in Atlanta, like if you and Bobby lived, say, 40 minutes away, I'm like, oh, my gosh, great. We'll go hang out with them. That will be our community. 40 minutes away. Now, now I can barely go to another street to hang out with people because there's enough people on my own street. Right, right. And I would much rather be intentional about a few people. Right. And just the other day on Saturday, this new couple moved to town. Tons of people are moving to Steubenville lately. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, we're, just gonna, we're renting. We're trying it out. As soon as they said that, I'm like, oh, I'm not investing in you. Uh, and I'm not a, I'm not sorry for that. I think I just I don't have time. I do not have time you... to invest in people who might be leaving again. Oh, there's a wound there, man. No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think no. so. I th I mean, there's probably wounds there, but that's not. I don't think that comes from a wounded place. I think it's that I just like you're saying, like I want to invest yeah. in people that I can grow in relationship with. Right. If people are here for a couple of months, I'm happy to hang out, but I'm not going to share my life with you in the same way yeah. I would as if I knew that. We'll be here together in 10 years, 20 years from now. Because your time, yeah, your time is very, it's, it's value. It, I mean, everyone's time is valuable, but I think when you have children and you have, it, you're absolutely right. Like you're like, I, I want people who are part of my community and not just, and, and not that you can't be friends with them or hang right. out with them, but yeah, you do, you do. Are want you people. finding that in Dallas? Do you have good friends close? Yes. Thank God. We go to an amazing, amazing parish. I'm part of the, the homeschool co-op and Bobby's part of the dad. So it's funny, Bobby knows all the dads and I know all the moms. And, nice. um, so we're, we're having that big group, but then thankfully we have a smaller core group of really good friends because mm -hmm. yeah, it is hard when you move away from your best friends and we're like, I grew up in Orange County, California. And that's where my family is. That's where my best friends are. And so God has definitely provided with like that small group of people. I'm like, thank you, Lord, mm -hmm. because I don't know. I feel like when you don't have community, it's extremely lonely, especially when you have little kids and, um, you know, you need, you need other people who are kind of in those stages with you, walking with you. And then you have the mentors too, who mm -hmm. are kind of showing you how, how to do Are things. you close to these community? Other than the fact that you share a parish together, are you walking distance or a short drive to these people's houses? No, I mean, Dallas like, is so spread out. Yeah, it's like 15 minutes. So it's not, yeah, that's not too, too bad. bad. And some of them are like seven minutes. So yeah. Yeah. But we have like once a month or every other week dinner nights with a couple couples and their kids. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's because the world is becoming increasingly insane that we need that more and more as Christians, mm -hmm. or if it's our stage of life where we want our children to be around other good families that we <clears throat> want that emphasis on community more. Yeah. And well, and just think of like social media. It, it's great to have people on social media who are like our community, but you absolutely need people mm -hmm. in person because the people on social media there's a sense that you feel like they know you and you know them, but you don't like, mm -hmm. you're not in their homes and you don't see the real, like mm -hmm. for instance, last year I, I had a miscarriage and it was like the people, I didn't even mention that on social media for a long time. So no one knew. I mean, but the people in my life knew yeah. and they were bringing me food and they were with me and they were, you know, some of them have gone through that too. So they're like bringing food. They're, they're, caring for you in real time and they they kind of see the reality you know so it's like it's great to have and you have this too around the country we have friends that at any yeah. moment we could call them we could visit them and that's so wonderful but then you have the people who are in your everyday life mm -hmm. who you who you really do need and so i feel for those people who are still looking for that especially when you're a mom and you're a stay-at-home mom and you're like and maybe you don't have family it's really it's it's hard. It's lovely when you have grandparents who are around you in it, but it's really hard. You feel very lonely and isolated when you don't have community. Mm -hmm. So we we I, I'm so for that. Like we need to have community and find people who can help us and walk with us because that's how it always used to be. Yeah, and um, we've had I think I think like fifty to a hundred families move to Subaru over the last year or two. Oh my gosh, maybe last year. Like wow. it's insane. And this isn't a plug for Steubenville, but what I'm trying to say is it feels like after the COVID lockdowns, people's jobs sometimes have become more flexible mm -hmm. so they can work from home, which means they can work from another state. And so right. I think more people might be trying to find a community of people to do life with, as it were. Yeah. And COVID was extremely isolating, too. Yeah. So I think people realize, like, I need people 
right? We we need other human beings. And think of like how demonic it is that like the culture is trying to go into this very um <sighs> Like the meta, the yeah. like the virtual <laughs> virtual reality, the virtual world. It's like forget that your forget your messy life over here. Right. We're just gonna keep you happy. It's like Instagram on steroids. Yeah, because Instagram's kind of like that. It's like fake. It's like now we want you to have like a virtual life. Yeah. Um, it makes me think of Dwight Schrute from The Office. Like he's like, I just love being a paper salesman. So in my second life, I'm That's gonna be right. a paper salesman too. You know. <laughs> but it, it's like no. Oh my gosh, like that, can you imagine the devil would love that? Like, first of all, to get us out of reality because reality is painful. Like real life is painful. Mm -hmm. It's messy. Um, You know, we have wounds that we don't want to deal with. And so to be like, come, it's like the sloth. Here's a thing for sloth or sloth or however you say Mm -hmm. it. I say sloth. Um, But, but essentially like, just forget your problems. Your, your, you know, your real life is not great. So we're just going to yeah. keep you in virtual reality. But that's kind of the, in, the endless scroll. Yeah. Is I'm just going to keep you bored or not bored. I'm going to keep you distracted from even your own. In, in a you, world. Yeah, yeah. Your own, tr- the, the reality, which can be painful. Like it's painful to start looking inward yeah. and being like, oh man. Yeah. Like I really want to be affirmed. Like I don't feel loved and I feel rejected and all those kind of things. Like it's hard to start looking inside and the devil's like, well then let's just keep you in an endless scroll. Yeah. (laughs) You know, So, uh, what what have you done to try to fight against that? Because it feels like technology is increasingly encroaching into our lives. Yes. One example of this is with these newer cars that break for you or even parallel park for you and are smarter than you are. Right. And then our phones are also like that. Or if you subscribe to a YouTube channel, it doesn't mean YouTube will suggest those videos because YouTube knows what you want to watch more than what you think you want to watch. Oh, my gosh. So as technology, in this sense, encroaches in our, on our lives, and you're, you're aware of that and articulated that so well, how are you and Bobby trying to stave that off? Right. Well, it's just you have to be kind of, on, I think, honest with yourself. Like, for me, it's like, okay, like, why do I have to ask myself why? Like, why do I spend so much time on this app? Am I escaping reality? And I think COVID kind of showed me that like, oh, like you don't want to be sad here. So you want to escape over here. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, so I'm escaping feeling this way. Or like for me, different apps bring different emotions. So like Mm -hmm. Instagram, it's like, oh, here's the envy again. Like, oh, I'm jealous of their perfect life, whatever. It's like, we all can feel that. Like I'm the jealousy of like seeing someone else's perfect reel, but that's like, that's not really their reality either. So it's like Instagram might make us feel one way. Twitter might make us feel angry or Mm -hmm, whatever. mm -hmm. So it's kind of like acknowledging what is this doing to me? And then how do I limit this? What can I replace it with? That's actually healthy instead of not great. And you know, you kind of just have to be aware of what's happening in you. And like, what are you actually searching for? Like, am I just seeking the likes, the affirmation, the comments, is that what I'm seeking? And does my worth come? Or if people are making mean comments, it's like, is my self-worth so wrapped up in those comments? Like, I'm not secure in Jesus enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like, I, I have to be <clears throat> honest with myself. Like, am I really secure in Jesus? Do you think alone? Instagram um, kind of is more of a pitfall for women? Because I hear women say that to me, that what you just said about the envy and like, uh, my life isn't as good as their life. I'm, I'm, maybe men feel this way as well, but I don't have men say that, verbalize that to me. Do you think it's yeah. a specific thing to women, how there, Instagram I mean, affects them? I did an article on teenagers and social, like teenagers and um, just kind of the state of Gen Z, right? And one of the crazy statistics, like just constant like studies done is on teenage girls and Instagram. Okay. And how the depression, the anxiety, the um, kind of the eating disorders, like all this stuff, because I don't know, like the visual, like, oh, I have to look like this mm-hmm. fake airbrush picture. And so maybe that is... It's an image-based social media yes, platform. it's image-based. And then when you follow, when people follow influencers who, yeah. on, on YouTube, I, I follow this one girl who's a photographer, or I always watch her videos, and she would kind of show all the the fake pictures like there were airbrushed and completely doctored and like the same day taken by a different photographer that wasn't doctored or whatever like that's so cool what someone really looked like she's like listen stop basing your self-worth like these are completely doctored look at Mm. like she would point out the lighting like and how they it was just amazing it was was fascinating but it's kind of sad that 
because it's image based and we we compare ourselves and mm-hmm. our self worth to like even me as a grown adult and someone who knows Jesus. I remember like. I walked, my friend and I were walking in a mall and there was a massive Victoria's Secret poster and I turned my head away, yeah. not for lust sake. Oh, my, my guy friend turned his head away. That's <laughs> the two of you. And he was like, walked into a pole. Yeah, that, yeah, he was like, that is somebody's sister. That is somebody's daughter. <laughs> Her name is Dolores. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's my grandma's name. Um, but he, like, I turned my face and I was like, why did I turn my face? I'm like, ah, because I don't want to compare myself yeah. to what I think. Like, really, is this airbrushed model? Mm-hmm. because that's how I'm tempted. Like, oh, you're not good enough. Like, mm-hmm. that's the lie. Like, you're not good enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not this enough, this enough, you know. Any beautiful person in a catalog becomes ugly under emergency room lighting. <laughs> emergency room Oh, just like, you know, like, yeah, like exactly. <laughs> like, you could put a fluoro light on the most beautiful oh. person in the world, and you're not going to find them nearly as beautiful. Well, it was very helpful to see one day, like, these supermodels, and just like their headshots without any makeup and not yeah. no hair. I was like, oh, praise the Lord. They yeah. actually look normal. Like, yeah, yeah. They look like normal human beings. Oh, I wonder my if goodness. that's becoming more of a temptation for men these days. Because I think it used to be that like women would compare themselves and try to look a certain way. Whereas you used to hear men say that that's not something that men really struggle with. But I don't know if that's true anymore with the CrossFit mm-hmm. culture and all that. But I, I don't know. I For me, what I see with the men is like the struggle to like... I, because of pornography, because like I need a girl who looks like a porn star Mm -hmm. and kind of um, in the young adult group, like back in Los Angeles, kind of we noticed like my friends and I have like the guys always go to the same girl. They don't go to the girl next door who's like lovely. They go to the same girl who they're like, oh, this is so like that might be the temptation, especially because this culture, like I have this idea of woman Mm -hmm. and she looks like whatever angelina jolie i mean for mm-hmm. me it's like hugh jackman the mm-hmm. man you know whatever <laughs> even even bobby loves hugh jackman so. <laughs> um but you know whatever it is like for for the the man to be tempted by like she must be like this perfect image of what the the porn star look which yeah. i think even normal women it's become so normal to like wear like fake eyelashes to mm-hmm. wear t- like when when the whole contour thing, it's like, oh my god! What does that gosh. mean? What's contour? The mean? contour. It was like the Kim Kardashian. Like we're gonna show the con. So, but almost like we're gonna just look. We're gonna try to look like porn stars twenty four seven. It's like, right. oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. So it's not that you can't look beautiful or classy, but it's like, what are what are the lies that I'm falling for here? That my self worth comes when I only look like this. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of interesting. But uh, you see, you know, obviously with pornography, you see it too, not just in looks but also like how women should act and what i'm looking for in a romantic yep. relationship and then when men, men get married i had a, a guy friend say to me he was like yeah it was crazy to get married and realize like oh well, yeah my wife isn't just gonna like react how i think she's gonna because re- we're not in a mm-hmm. porn film <laughs> like it, you yes, know what i mean right jason everett said so wisely that pornography is not the fulfillment of marriage um i beg your pardon marriage is not the fulfillment of porn Porn is the distortion of love. Mm. And I often think, I've been thinking about this more and more, about how, like, if I wrongly assess a thing's essence and use it inappropriately, I would get frustrated at that thing. So if I thought this cup were a door stopper Mm -hmm. or something, (laughs) and it kept failing at that, I would get angry with this thing. And I think that pornography is a lie about what a woman is, and I think that frustration that you may see in some men is coming into confrontation with reality. And at that point, you have to make an adjustment. But the right. difference is, and this is what's tough, is that pornography, while a demonic lie about women and men and sexuality, there is some truth in it in that women and men are sexual beings. But the right. problem with it is it takes some beautiful uh, slither of reality in the woman and just sort of expands it to be a hundred percent of the woman. Right. Does that make sense? Well, she just like becomes that's all a, she is. Yeah. She just becomes an object. And that's different with the doorstopper idea because there's no sense in which this is a doorstopper, but there is a sense in which a woman or a man is a sexual being. So it makes it even more difficult to sort of um, interact in that space and appropriately. It reminds me of the priest who once said to me, It's easier to be celibate than to use your sexuality appropriately. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like perfect moderation is much harder than 
<laughs> I tried to use that line in confession once. I was like, Father. He was like, you know, you could just not kiss till marriage. I'm like, Father, let me tell you. I think it was Augustine. That's, uh, <laughs> I probably needed to confess that as well that I told the priest. Um, <laughs> what did Augustine say? I, I think he said like kind of like celibacy is easier than perfect oh, like he? moderation. Yeah, I think that's right. Like yeah. trying to be especially. Yeah. So it, that's what yeah. the devil does. The devil distorts our desires because yeah. it's like we know when it comes to pornography, the reason and you obviously talk about this is it's attractive. There's something in us that mm-hmm. entices us because there is a part of us that desires this beauty, this truth, this goodness. That's how we are made. And the devil distorts that mm-hmm. to be something so ugly to to make us just and to th- make people just things, objects. And the thing I'm realizing, too, is it's not enough to intellectually assent to the fact that pornography is a lie and you shouldn't treat subjects as merely objects. Because I think that's what is confusing for a lot of people, be that men or women who look at pornography before entering marriage. They have this sort of like intellectual conversion when they say, OK, yeah, you shouldn't treat people as things. And that's why pornography is evil. And a light turns on. But the, the lies of pornography and the sexualized, pornified culture go so much deeper that I would say even 16 years into marriage, I'm still detecting those lies and praying in the name of Jesus to uproot them. Yeah. And Pope John Paul in Love and Responsibility, I mean, his whole thesis was that the opposite of love is use. Yeah. To use a person not, I mean, and he even said, you can use a person in two ways. You mm-hmm. can use someone as an object for your pleasure, or you could use a woman as an object for your pleasure, but you also could use her as like a concubine just to bear babies. I mean, almost mm. like, so it's like, oh my gosh, like we can use people, um, and, and then we can use people emotionally for my affirmation, for, for my and self-worth. And sorting through that. Yes. So and difficult. so, yeah, when you're married, it doesn't just go away. It doesn't just disappear. Because I mean, it, what's crazy right, is like, you're a mystery even to yourself, as I am. Like, I'm a mystery I to sure myself. Am. I don't I know sure. why. And in a good, in a good sense, <laughs> right, and in right. a not so good sense, like, I don't know why I do the things that I do <laughs> right. uh, sometimes, or I'm not aware why I react in the way that I react. Where's that coming from? And then you bring two people together into this intimate relationship, and the two of you are a mystery to yourself, <laughs> let alone to each other. It's, and it's, and you yeah. have to, and you're figuring that out in marriage. I mean, the fact that you've been married for 16 years, I've been married for nine years, and Bobby and I are still having conversations like uh, how we're different as men and women. Mm-hmm. I'm like, still, it's yeah. just, that's the beauty of when you're married to somebody that you can be vulnerable with, that you are safe with. Like, it, oh mm-hmm. man, I am so passionate about making sure people marry the right people. Like, Talk about that. Okay. So like, I wish that I had a... um like an engagement encounter weekend that broke up 50% of the couples. I'm like, if half of you are going to get divorced anyways, let's have, it's better 14 broken engagements than one broken marriage. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm like passionate about making sure because marriage is so important. It can affect generations. Like so many people, we just think it's always our chemistry with this person. It's like, no, this affects your children and it's going to affect their children. And obviously um, I, I talk about the cycle of sin in a family, like, we all know abuse continues, a, the, a, adultery, addiction, this all stuff general, just continues. We pass it down to our children and it doesn't stop until someone's like, no, I don't want this. So it's like for me, yeah. I think about my family tree and like in my family tree, I have some horrific things. Like I, I do, I have abuse, rape, um, addiction, adultery, you know, pornography, addi- all this stuff. And when I had my conversion in my Catholic, I was raised Catholic, but I was very lukewarm. And when I really fell in love with Jesus, I was like, this stops with me. Mm. I am not going to marry a man who cheats on me. I'm going to wait for a man who treats me with respect. I am going to wait for a man who's going to, his goal is going to get, is going to help get me to get to heaven. You know, like I don't want to marry a man who is addicted. And so like, I was like, I will wait however long it's going to take. I'll wait till I'm 50. I don't care. Like, because I know it isn't so important. This is going to affect our children. Um, and now thankfully the Lord brought me Bobby when I was 28, I think, but I just met, I've met two 50 year old women who just got married mm. their first marriage. And they're like, I would have waited all over again. Cause the other option is what do you do? You grasp, right. yeah. you grasp because you're lonely, you grasp because you're afraid and you marry like, not that Bobby and I are, are happy to break up people but we when people write me they're like i read i wrote a blog called um the devil wants you to settle in your relationship and i have multiple people who are like i broke up with my boyfriend after this you know i'm like great awesome um because i have met i i meet the children of these 
I have the chap like I'll speak to teenagers about this kind of stuff and the chaperones are the ones coming up to me being mm. like I wish I would have heard this when I was 18 because oh, my them. husband just cheated on me with my best friend who's 20 years old or whatever mm -hmm. like I you know I wish I would have known this because marriage is supposed to be a foretaste of heaven but it can be a foretaste of hell when I just think like when you marry somebody out of fear when you're grasping and not to say that it can't get better um, but a priest once told me who when he said this to me, it changed a lot. He said to me, when he was in seminary, he realized there were three types of guys. He's like, there were those who were called by God to be priests. There were those who called themselves to the priesthood. And there were those who were called by Satan. And I was like, whoa. And I realized the same thing could be said about marriage. There are those who you can tell were called by the Lord in that uh -huh. marriage, like the fruits that come from that marriage. There are those who called themselves and there are those who are called by Satan. Like you think about abuse, like abusive situations or where people marry somebody, they were coerced into a marriage or whatever it is. Um, but I am so passionate. Like the Lord doesn't want us to be miserable. He wants us to bear the fruits of the spirit, to bear the fruits of generosity, love, patience, kindness. Mm -hmm. And I feel like sometimes Catholics, <laughs> I've heard this said like, well, love is a choice. So just marry whoever. I'm like that's terrible mm, advice. Terrible. No. <laughs> and the thing is, I've heard people say too, like, oh, once you get married, everything gets better. Yeah, no, no, it gets worse. Well, it gets, it, everything gets, uh, the volume goes up to 11. Everything oh, gets exaggerated. Everything gets exposed. Yeah. All the stuff like, oh, my porn problem will go away when I get married. No, it's going to be exposed. Mm -hmm. All my wounds, like people who have childhood abuse, mm -hmm. sexual abuse that they've never dealt with, that absolutely comes out in a marriage. And it's devast it's devastating to have to deal with it. And some people even 10 years into marriage are dealing with those, mm -hmm. what the, the stuff, the trauma that maybe they never dealt with. So I'm very, I'm very passionate about uh because I always, it's hard for me when I give talks about the beauty of marriage, but then I have people who are married and they're like, well, what do I do? And I'm like, oh, you go to counseling, like, please, like yes. do whatever you can go to therapy. But that's why I'm like, I feel like I, those who aren't married yet, I'm at least, <clears throat> yeah. maybe I can help you and to I make I imagine that's decisions. really difficult for a, say, 25 year old woman to hear you say that when she thinks easy for you to say, Jackie, like you're married, it's a great guy, you got four kids. Um, but I suppose you would say it would be better for both either a man or a woman, because uh, just like there are, for lack of a better word, trashy guys, there are trashy women. Yes? Yeah, yeah, right. I know. And I don't, I, how dare you say that? Yeah, by trashy, yes. I don't mean irredeemable, but it seems to me that if you're going to say that there can be selfish, obnoxious, self-centered, egotistical men, then of course you can say the same thing of women, right. and we shouldn't be marrying in that wounded place uh, or to the degree that it's possible not to. Um but I would imagine, yeah, like, what do you say to a woman who's 25? And I mean, that's really cool that you had that self-confidence to say, I would rather be 50 and then get married. Well, I say I would rather be single and happy in Jesus than miserable in a marriage. Yeah. I would. I absolutely yeah, would because yeah. I've seen people in miserable marriages yeah, and I've seen yeah. the divorces and I've and seen I think my oh, sister just the got, My sister just got married, Emma. She's 32. Mm -hmm. Like, that's quite late to get married. But thank God she got married now. Her husband's a wonderful, holy, yeah. good man. And she's a wonderful, holy, good woman. And thank God. I mean, I think there was probably times for many years where she thought, I guess I'm just never going to get married, you know? Yeah. And well, I have friends in their late 30s. I have friends in their 40s who are still waiting. And they're still waiting. And I don't know what God's plan is for them. But I do, I do know that I've had 50-year-old women come up to me and they're like, listen, I got married when I was 50 and I would have waited all yeah. over again because, and personally, I absolutely believe because I was a happy single person. So I like, I really kind of think like if you're a miserable, miserable single person, you're going to be a miserable married person. Marriage isn't an idol. It's not going to fix all your problems because people have this idea like, oh, once I get married, it'll all be fine. Like, yeah. no, it's not an ask idol. any married person. Ask any married any, person and they one, will grab them. absolutely yeah. tell you, yeah. no, <laughs> no, not that marriage, not that it gets worse, but it's just all exposed. Yeah. It's all exposed. All those insecurities, all that woundedness, it all comes out. Up to the surface. Oh, it it yeah. all comes out if you haven't dealt with it, and so um, if I don't, and we don't want to kind of like lead people into a state of inaction either because they're so afraid. I mean, right. However much stuff you've had healed in your life, we're all on this journey, and so stuff yeah, continually comes to the surface, which right. is one of the most healing things about my marriage is having a woman see my brokenness and my impatience and my lust and my selfishness and all that and love me 
Oh wow, that's a healing thing, and I'm sure you'd say Bobby that, loving you. Yes, because just... that's how that that's like the set. Now it's like yeah, the person's not your savior; they're not your therapist. Right. But there is a healing element to marriage because it's a sacrament, mm-hmm. and you the two are the ministers of the sacrament. So there is healing because it's Jesus's love, and how beautiful. Like for me, it, I tell people like they're like, how do you know they're the one? Right, yeah. the, the one you're called to marry, and and I'm like because I heard a nun say it, and I was like that's. Perfect. This nun was said she knew her vocation when she felt like she was home. Yeah. I was like, that's right. Like when people say like, oh, I just, I knew, like, I just knew people yeah. hate that. I, yeah. But it's like, because there's a sense of like, I feel safe. Mm-hmm. I don't and, have and maybe to too pretend. That, like when I'm around Cameron, I feel like I'm a better person. Yeah. That's probably a good sign too. Yeah. And I can be myself yes. and they call me onto greatness. Yeah. A better person, not in the sense that I have to pretend to be better, but I actually feel lifted up. Another thing that I... Uh, it's, it's funny, like when you meet and you date and you're so clouded by the romance, it might mm-hmm. be difficult to discern. But I, I think one thing I'm one sign that Cameron was going to be an amazing woman is that everyone in my life who I respected said that she was an amazing woman. These yeah. are people who I respected their opinion. They all went, dude, marry her immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Now. I think if I was dating someone who wasn't so amazing, I probably wouldn't have cared about their advice either way. Right. But to have people you revere as good, holy people know this person and say, yes, like yes. For whatever faults they have. Yes. Yeah. Bobby had a priest in his life who's like, are you in, more in love with the reality than the romance? Hmm. Because some people fall in love with the idea of the person and they're not actually in love with the person. How do you discern that in the moment? So I, I'm thinking of a couple that we prayer block, <laughs> we prayer block them. Um, so what they're like, we're, we're, <laughs> we feel like we're engaged. And I'm like, I mean, like, yes. Or like, oh no. So the couple that I was like, oh no, I was like, Bobby, we need to prayer block this. So well, what does that mean? Prayer block? <laughs> it's like, Lord, I pray that your will be done, but I know this is not the right relation. I'm, we're like joking, but I'm like, but not really. Cause I'm like, Lord, I don't think this is the right. I, cause I oh, could see block them. Meaning you're trying to subvert the thing that they want. Well, is that what the word block, block means? Like, <laughs> just like block. Like I don't want them to get married. Yeah, cause I don't yeah, think, gotcha. cause I intuitively <laughs> knew he's in love with the idea of this girl and not her. Uh huh. Like I know it like, and sure enough, five months later, they, they broke off their mm-hmm. engagement. Cause I was like, I, I, and I kind of mentioned it to my friend. I was like, I think the problem was like when you were away from her, you idealized and had this image of who you thought she was. And you were in love with the idea of the person. But when you were actually with her, you were kind of like uh, a miserable. Oh, really? Well, yeah, you just, you don't feel and there's, yeah, there can be that pit in the stomach. There's something not right. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we can't even name it and that's yes, okay. But there's yes. like, oh, something's not right. But then, especially if you're long distance and when you're away, you like, Fall in love with the idea. Yes. So I could kind of see, see like that. you're in love with the idea of the person and not the person. So Bobby's priest friend, he was like, make sure you're more in love with the reality than the romance. Um, and I remember a couple of years ago, there was like a celebrity divorce and they'd been married for 10 years. And in the in like People magazine, it was like, it was because we were becoming too much like friends. And I was what? like, <laughs> that's what you're marriage is supposed to be based yes. on it's like a virtuous friendship yes. right there, there are there are people who think um that you're not supposed to be friends with your spouse and i'm like well you're Have not you... supposed to be like gal pals but right there's different forms of friendship yeah right like aristotle C- c.s lewis said friendship is love is friendship caught on fire yeah and aristotle there were three different types of friendship you have a friendship of utility is when mm-hmm. you're just friends with someone because it's useful, like you're on the same team, you work together. And when it's not useful anymore, when you're not on the same team, you're really not friends anymore. Then there's a friendship of enjoyment mm-hmm. where you enjoy the same things. And then when you don't enjoy those things anymore, yeah. your friendship kind of fades. Yep, yep. But the best kind of friendship is a friendship, a virtuous friendship. Yeah. And that's where you have a common goal, a yep. common aim. Your 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 relationship is made a, a something like outside yourselves. And so... As as Christians, as Catholics, it's like our marriages should absolutely based on, be based on a virtuous friendship where our common goal is heaven. Our common aim is to, is to bring each other closer to Jesus. Mm-hmm. That, so when they said that, like, oh, we were becoming too much like friends, like saying like our chemistry died out. And I was like, well, if you don't like 99.9% of your marriage is friendship, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you're, like people think like, oh, we're just going to have sex all the time. Like, no, that's not what happens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that's not how it works. Like you have to have a virtuous friendship. You have to mm-hmm. want to be around this person 24-7. You know what's really cool about Cameron is I, I was afraid that I wasn't really attracted to her and she felt the same way. 
I was afraid I wanted to be attracted to her because we were such good friends. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be cool if I could be attracted to one of my close friends? That's nice, huh? Wait, she thought, though, both of the us same thought, about you or she yeah, thought the same way us, towards you? Both of us thought that. We were very good friends and there were times... Uh, so we served with Net Ministries yeah. and then I went back to Australia. She went back to America and we were like, we weren't sure if we there would be that chemistry. And we both independently thought maybe we just want that chemistry so bad because we're such good friends. Right. So I'm so glad that our relationship is based on that friendship, you know, because right. we were, the chemistry came. Did it come? Holy crap. <laughs> like a wave. <laughs> it was great. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. It came. Yeah, yeah. I, I just... I, when people are like, just get married to anybody because um, love is a choice. I'm like, that is horrible advice. Nobody There's... has ever said that, though. Oh, Nobody has have... ever said that oh, sentence. They sure and have. It. They have said it. They have responded it to me because I, I'm like, no, you need. So <laughs> like almost like an arranged marriage. Like I literally have had people say like, oh, kind of we should just have arranged marriages. Again. I'm open to that. Oh, my, I am don't open. stop it. Yeah. Stop it. No, yeah. um, it works because for... love is a choice. And I'm like. Yeah, but you still have to make love to this person. Yeah. Like, for the love of God, and worse, people. share a kitchen with them. <laughs> share a kitchen. Right. Where they're always standing right oh in front of the gosh. drawer you need. So every annoying. Time. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I will say I was working, I won't say which community, but I was working with a community of people where a lot of their parents have arranged, kind of like arranged marriages. How'd that go? But the children are like, it's rough. Mm. Because they're like, I see, like, they can't, in that community, there's not a divorce rate. Um, so like, you know, when I speak to teens, a lot of times the, the divorce rate of their parents is pretty high. But in this particular community, the divorce rate isn't high at all because it's assumed that you stay married to this, but there is no divorce, right? It's not an option. But then they witness ab abuse, essentially, mm -hmm. between the husbands and the wives. I mean, it's, oh, it's heartbreaking. So I, yeah, I just have a heart for, Bobby and I both have a heart for single people and we mm -hmm. want like, God doesn't want you to be miserable. Mm -hmm. I think some people really think that like, yes. God just wants me to suffer. Yes. No, guys, life is going to bring suffering. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. But I bring you be my good peace. Cheer. Yeah. I've and overcome be good the world. And only in heaven. It's like in, in Revelation, it says in heaven, there will be no more weeping, no more suffering, no more sadness, no more pain. I mean, that's we are called to this eternal life with God in heaven. In fact, in the catechism, I... I love that it said this because, again, back in my Oprah days, there was a book called The Secret. Do you remember this? Yes, I do. The Secret. And it yeah. like kind of compiled all the world's religion, like scriptures and whatever mm. of The Secret. But you know, in the catechism, it actually says that the inner God has an inner, innermost secret. And God's innermost secret is that God is an eternal exchange of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he mm -hmm. destines for us to be a part of that eternal exchange of love. That's what he wants for us is mm -hmm. to partake in that eternal exchange of love. And what's so beautiful is marriage is supposed to be a foretaste of that eternal exchange of love. Yeah. And so, oh, it just, I, you know, and obviously you and I aren't just like, oh, we're lucky. And like, oh, well, Jackie, good for you. Because I've had people say that like, oh, you and Bobby have a fairy tale, whatever, marriage. And I'm like, no. Yeah. Press in on that for us. No, we don't. Yes. Like, well, I mean, first of all, we're not perfect. Bobby is not God. I'm not God. We are not perfect. We have our own wounds and everything. But I, I could tell you I have hundreds, if not thousands of couples that I could point you to who have beautiful holy marriages. And they're all unique. They mm -hmm. all have their own, you know, little weird eccentricities, yes, yes. whatever. We're all different. Yep. But it, they're beautiful friendships with romance. They're so beautiful and they're both seeking Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh, well, you two are just lucky. It's like, no, like, oh, you know, you have your fairy tale. It's like, no, Bobby and I argue. We still have, you know, just whatever. We've learned how to commu communicate better. We still have, obviously, I, I arguments. remember a point in my marriage with my wife where I realized that our marriage wasn't unbreakable. Yeah. We fought, there was this one particular fight that scared the shit out of me mm. because it was awful. It was awful. It happened about four years ago and it was like both of our insecurities and wounds were just crushing against each other. And it was the first time I realized that there's nothing, it's, yeah, just like I said, it's not unbreakable. Right. And, and even I, in I, marriage. I need, I need, I, sorry, I need, to, I need to kind of just sort of finish this conversation because I, I don't know how that sounds to people, especially mm -hmm. those who either aren't married or who are newly married and don't know what that could possibly mean. But it is, it can be, marriage can be grueling, especially when your desire and disordered desires 
when you start to see the other as an enemy because they accidentally treaded on your wound or something, mm. that's a really terrifying thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that if I didn't know the Lord, I think I would just be tempted to try. I'd be, I'd be of the opinion that I'm meant to find happiness in my wife and the fulfillment of all desire in my wife. And that this is the only life I've got, so I need to go and find that somewhere else. Because this must be wrong then. Like, since we had this fight, um, that therefore that's a sign that we're not whatever, and i got to go find it somewhere else. But what was so beautiful was transcending that and then getting to kind of reflect upon what just happened there and what what did I think you said and coming through that has been has been so beautiful. But it is important that that you say that to people, that it's it's not a fairy tale marriage. That's so, so bloody important. You know, but that also the devil at any point of your marriage, the devil hates marriage. Yes. So you think the devil is going to want to yeah, he's come in you. and he's a jerk, right? He's going to try to come in at any point when maybe emotionally you're a little distant from your spouse. Mm-hmm. And then here comes the old. I mean, I've seen this happen so many times. And so I have to be on guard, too. But like. Uh, the old boyfriend comes in, the ex-boyfriend yep. comes in, I, I've seen on Facebook, on yep. it's in yep. slides yep. in yeah. your DMs, you. you know? Yes. So you Smelling have- Smelling like the fulfillment of all my desire. <laughs> That's <Smelling>. it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and and then in our minds, we think, oh, this person could be per- the perfect. Yes. It's like, no. <laughs> but But I have to know, well, first of all, I have to know that I am capable of evil. Yes. Right. I, I, I'm a recovering Pharisee. I will raise my, I am a recovering Pharisee who mm-hmm. used to be like, well, I'm better than everyone. Cause I don't, I never did that. Or I never did that. Yeah. And when the, when it happened in my brain that I realized I am just as capable mm-hmm. of all these things. Name us in. Adult, yep. yeah, name, adultery. I. Yes. I am just as capable of this, except for the, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, he gives me the grace. Mm-hmm. Whew, and even to build virtue, but at any moment, it, the devil can try to tempt us. The devil can whatever, and he'll wait for those moments in our marriage. So in psychology, I remember learning that most divorces happen in year one of marriage, year seven, and mm. year 20, mm. right? At year 20 is like when the kids go, go mm-hmm. off to college and now they're, but so I always, that always stuck with me. And I have met friends who like the seven year itch, right? It's like called like the seven year itch of marriage. It's like now you've been married for seven years and uh, there's struggle or maybe it's 12 years, whatever that fight that you had that you realize like, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. But the, the, we have to be on guard as well of what's going on in me and in our relationship. And we can't, it's like we, we don't fear the devil because he's a mere creature and we have the Holy Spirit within us. I'm not to be afraid of the devil. The devil is not the opposite of God, right? Mm-hmm. God is God and the devil's a fallen angel. Um, but I have to be on guard because I am human and mm-hmm. on the, our best day, we are only human and we are still capable of serious evil. Um, and when I realized that, I think that helped me to be like, okay, Lord, I can't just rely on my own um, like I can't be self like this devilish self-reliance, like oh, I can do it all. No, I can't. I need Jesus and I need his grace and I need his mercy. And I, I need to still continue to grow in virtue and be on guard that, yeah, the devil, especially in my marriage, hates us because we're trying to proclaim the good news of marriage and how scandalous would it be? Mm-hmm. Yes. If you and how, Bobby were to divorce yeah, or divorce, me and Cameron that would were. Be, Absolutely scandalous. Mm-hmm. And we all know we all know the situations where we have been scandalized, whether by priests or yep. by married couple, you know, whatever. We know how heartbreaking it is because we held up somebody as mm-hmm. a whatever. So yeah, we we are on our journey together and even individually towards the Lord and and, and growing and trying to grow in holiness. But we're not perfect, you know? Yeah, I love what you said too about every marriage has its idiosyncrasies and it's unique. Mm-hmm. It's obviously unique. And how true is that? I mean, if every individual is unique and has their own idiosyncrasies, of course that's going to be true of two unique people coming together. And I think that that's, um, that's something I've had to be on guard against in my marriage is looking over the fence, as it were, or looking on Instagram and wondering why my marriage isn't the way I'm imagining their marriage is. Right. Has that right. been a thing for you? Um, if not, I can just talk about, it. <laughs> don't mean to no, put that on you. you. Can, no, I, yeah. I, I have been uh, since meeting Bobby, I'm like, Lord, you could not have placed me with a better man. Mm-hmm. Like I just, I'm, I'm just so grateful for Bob. I'm like, cause I remember praying, 
my prayer is, Lord, if I could be a nun, but I'm not called to be a nun, I need a guy who could be a priest, but it's not called to be a mm-hmm. priest. And sure enough, Bobby had been in seminary for three years. Mm-hmm. I had just learned being a nun, you know. And so I just, when I met Bobby, I was like, okay, this is it. And I'm not necessarily just talking about the relationship of the couple, though that's part of it. I mean, family dynamics, how the house is run, how tidy the house oh, gosh, is. You yeah. know, it, this It's so dangerous to start looking at other couples and judging your interior against their exterior. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's like the the envy of the Instagram, the perfect. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally, I know when I take a picture of my beautifully manicured kitchen, it's because I've thrown all the crap and on the couch. <laughs> in, in, in the oven. Like, li- a good, yeah. Good, uh, literally, I'm like, that. all right, if I want to take a picture of this room, I just have to take all the stuff and just put it on yeah. this, the other room real quick yeah. and take a picture and it looks great. I went to a friend's house the other day and there was crap everywhere. And like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, are you kidding? Thank you. This helps me to realize <laughs> that all of our houses look like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's like the Catholic, the Catholic motherhood, like, oh, yeah. what, whatever that people, it looks like, oh, that looks so amazing. And this looks so, and you do it so perfectly. And mm-hmm. you kind of feel like a failure. Like, I, I don't we all kind of at some point feel like a fraud? Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, you do. You feel like a fraud. Like, all right, well, I'm a, I'm a big fat fraud. And I don't, you mm-hmm. kind of fake it till you make it. But it, yeah, it is hard to compare yourself for me in the motherhood realm. Who? Okay. That happens a lot. Like, yeah. there's just so much shame, shame and judgment in like, and it's not just Catholic. It's just mother. You go on any mommy blog. Whoo, it is shame tastic. Like, I want to, I, I want you to talk about that. But um, I think one of the reasons for this, and I'd love to know your thoughts, is that as our culture, if you want to call it that, continues to deteriorate and either downplays the importance of, say, sex or marriage or motherhood, right? Right. Then we have to come along and redefine very clearly what we mean by those things, by sex and gender roles and things like that. Uh, So you have people trying to speak structure into the abyss that modernism has created. And so we're trying to say, no, no, here's what a mother looks like, which in a way is helpful since collectively we've all forgotten. But what's harmful about it, and I imagine that's what you're getting at, is right. yeah, is that it just looks one way. Yes. And the best thing you can do is to do God's will. Like, literally, I can't tell you, you need to be a mom who does this, 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 this. It's like, no, you do what God's will is. You do God's will. That's the best thing I could tell you. For instance, people, because I speak and I travel, people are like, oh, well, when you get married and have kids, you're going to stop doing that, right? And my and Bobby said to me, Jackie, I want you to do this as long as God is calling you to do this. And I was like, I, I'm, I love my husband. Like, he's so good. And so obviously in my own discernment, I have, you know, when I had one kid, I took the baby with me everywhere for the first, first year as I was nursing her. But mm-hmm. And I would do that with all my children. Um, but yeah, it gets harder, obviously, as you more kids. And I homeschool. And so mm-hmm. the travel, it has to, it it is changing in my own discernment that d- definitely does change. But to say like, women can't work, women can't do this, you must do this, must do this. Like, Stop no. wearing pants. We said that <laughs> earlier. All those things that we keep insisting upon. And again, I think it comes from a, a place of... It's chaos out there, so we need order. Yes. We need it. And we do. We do need it. Right. But then it gets weird sometimes. Well, you fight a bad... It's like fighting a bad idea with another bad idea. And that's not the goal. Like, for instance, like radical feminism, right? Bad, like, bad, like women, you're the same as men. It's like, no, we're not. We're equal to mm-hmm. men in dignity, but we're not the same. We have beautiful things that are different. I can bear life. My husband cannot. Oh my gosh, I'm going to get canceled just for saying that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like Your husband can lift stuff way heavier than oh, you can lift. Way heavier. Holy and he, smokes. He does. And your strength as a woman has nothing to do with right. what you can lift, it turns out. So to fight these ideas, sometimes we go the opposite way and mm-hmm. try to create so much order like, well, then women, only you must only wear skirts or like this men, is. you must like we have these make up these like gender roles. Um right. We fight bad ideas with another, instead of saying we are uniquely beautiful and different and we have different things that we can offer as men and women, different strengths. Mm -hmm. um, But that doesn't mean I have to be put in either one of these boxes. I do the will of God. One one of my favorite scripture verses that I memorized when I was a young, a youngin was Romans 12, one and two to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. And that says this, do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. 
Now, here's the thing. The will of God is going to look different for every person in every marriage. It's going to look so different. And so I, no one can tell you this is God's will for your life. You have to discern that. And and at the same time, it's not a solo activity. It's something you're discerning in relationship with trusted people. Right. And those trusted people know your life and they know Bobby and they know about your travel schedule and your talks and your children, right? Yeah. Because I, I, I fear that if you just say, well, you should just do what God's will is, people would take that as a blank check. Well, whatever I want to do is God's will. But well, that's not what you mean. and it's also assuming that you are, like, that you're gr- growing in a mature faith. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's kind of like the whole conscience thing. Yeah. Like, listen to your conscience. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's yes. like, But the con- your conscience has, has to be to, formed. And it conforms to an objective criteria. It's kind of like the whole contraception thing. I just read in the catechism, like you, you can't just, when it comes to contraception, it's not like, oh, well, I feel this way about this. Right? It's like, no, it has to object to, or it has to conform to an objective criteria of morality. Mm-hmm. Like it's not just a subjective, like I feel, I feel. So even discerning God's will, I mean, there are going to be certain things that, that obviously like I'm going to experience the fruits of the spirit. I'm going to experience peace and joy. But also, is it a virtuous choice? Like, is this, the, am I like abandoning my children when I do this? Like, am I still being attuned to my children? Am I still mm-hmm. loving the way I can? You know, so even me discerning my um, ministry with my family, I, I also have to discern all those things. Like, is this good? Is this loving? You know, so it's not just like however I feel. That's yeah. the hard part. It's like yeah. the church kind of assumes that you're growing in a mature faith. Yeah. Which is talk to hard. me about mummy blogs being shame fests because I've had no experience of oh, this. <laughs> I mean just everything from how you birthed your baby to how you breastfed or did not breastfeed yes. your baby. I mean it is shame and I I could say like I love that that's why like unsolicited <laughs> advice. Because but it, yeah, go. Well, I say unsolicited advice. I I don't give too much, like I only, our friends that are getting married or like that are becoming moms, there's like, I kind of try to say, if this helps, take it or like, take yeah, it or leave it. Yeah. Here's something that was like super helpful, but take it or leave it. And that it. gives people the freedom to actually assess it. Yeah. Whereas if they feel like you're imposing it upon them, like you their defenses go up against it, even if you're right. Right. Homeschooling is one of those things. Right. Like you just mentioned homeschooling, just by mentioning that you homeschool your kids, someone's going to feel shame about that, right. even though you didn't intend it. I also had four unmedicated births and breastfed my baby. People are going to feel super threatened and shamed by that state. Yeah. It's like, no. <laughs> like so, so then how do you assess uh, whether the shame blog, as you refer to it, the mummy blogs are shame fests, some of them, obviously not all of them. How do you know that that, how do you know when that's saying more about you than what, than them? Most of the time it is saying more about you. I, see. <laughs> like, I feel like most of the time we internalize. Yeah. Most of the time we internalize it because of our woundedness. Mm-hmm. Um, we feel rejected. We feel abandoned. We, we, feel, we feel shame. And I would say whenever we do feel those things, it's always good to reflect like, why do I feel that way? Yeah. I, you know? I've noticed that too, that uh, when I go to a party and maybe I'm chatting with somebody and I feel dismissed, well, I feel like that person didn't give me enough attention. Like what's going on there? I think I used to think what's wrong with them. And now thank God, perhaps growing in maturity is like, why, what's that saying about me? Yeah. You know? Why do I feel that way? And even if they did the thing, here, here's the thing, even if they did dismiss you, yeah. why does it matter? Like, wow, we put a lot of our own worth based on other people's actions, which in, in a sense speaks the truth that we, we need people and we, are made for community and that it hurts us. Mm-hmm. But in the other sense, like God, Thomas Aquinas, so God, God alone satisfies and Teresa Battle, you know, like mm-hmm. God alone is enough that, man, I really, Jesus satisfies all my desires and needs, but I, I go to people in, in a way that's, that's, be, that comes from like our need for others. Like we do need others, but really we seek those out a lot of times in un, unhealthy ways. So yeah, whenever, whenever I go on Instagram or whatever, and I feel shamed, I'm like, why do I feel this way? Or, you know, like when people read posts and they assume it's always about them, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Oh, right. Yeah. It's like, I didn't even say that towards us. <laughs> Wasn't even thinking of you. Wasn't even thinking. But, Champion. But that's a, that speaks to a woundedness when people assume that you're you know, attacking them. You're attacking them. It's like, you probably think this song is about you, right? Like. <laughs> Yeah, but it really, it's not vanity. It's its a woundedness of, I feel attacked. And 
I will say this is one beautiful thing about our culture is where, whereas like in the, the boomer culture, it was very much like we don't talk about our problems and we don't, we're not vulnerable and just move on, buckle up, butter, like just move on. This culture is very open about talking about our wounds, but the prob, the only, again, we go way too far sometimes and we go to victimhood and we go to, which is like nar- this narcissistic culture where we stay in this victimhood instead of like growing from this victim to a victor mentality, you know? So, um, I don't know why I thought about that, but I just, I realized like all this, this, sh- it's beautiful to talk about all this mm-hmm. and, and how we, you know, feel and stuff. But at the same time, like Jesus calls us to be victors, not just to stay in our wounds, mm-hmm. not just to stay victims. He calls us out of that into being new creation and into a new life through mm-hmm. him, you know? Amen. I know. It's great. Amen. Let's take a break. And then when we come back, I've got 8,000 questions I want to ask you, I think. So if you guys are in the live chat right now and you're a local supporter, click, go over to locals and ask a question and we'll get to your question soon. Hey, you there looking at me, you know what the number one Catholic app on the app stores is Hallow, H-A-L-L-O-W. It's a prayer and meditation app, which is faithful to the teachings of the Catholic Church and is incredibly well produced. Go check them out, hello.com slash Matt, two T's. Um, link is in the description below. If you go and download it on your phone, um, you got to start paying a small amount every month. But if you go to hello.com slash Matt, you can sign up and you'll get three months for free. It has sleep stories. One thing you might want to do, especially if you're a parent, they have sleep stories for kids. And so getting to play scripture to kids is super cool. Mm-hmm. Also, all of my lo-fi stuff is now over there. I'm just not interested, Matt, because I can't listen to your voice on that app. Well, you, well, you could. Is that is that the setup? <laughs> yeah, that okay, setup, you can. <laughs> I don't know why you'd want to, but if you want to terrify yourself, I mean, if you, speaking of sibling horror, this is far more creepy. <laughs> if you want to listen to me read the Bible to you like this, and you know, I wouldn't want that. Scott Hahn also does. Really <laughs> yeah, so forget about me. Scott Hahn's there. Jason Everett, Jackie, uh, Francois. So go go check them out. Hallow.com slash Matt. Hallow, H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt. It's fantastic. And next, I want to say thank you to Parla. You guys have heard about Parla. It is social media the way it was meant to be. I'm over on Parla. So if you click the link in the description below, you can go see my profile and sign up over there. Being on Parla means freedom from reach affecting algorithms and shadow bans. Actually, one thing that's interesting is when I post something on Twitter versus when I post something on Parla, I actually get more engagement on Parla, even though I've got like 3000 followers over there and who knows, 50,000 or something followers, I didn't even know, uh, over on Twitter. Um, so you actually get to reach more people because you're not getting banned. It means being free to speak your mind. It means freedom from cancel culture and freedom to grow. So go check out Parler. Click the link in the description below and sign up. Start following me if you want to. We're always posting the videos that we're putting here. Uh, Parler knows what it's like to be canceled. They've been there, but they rose from the ashes, never wavering in their free speech mission. The reason is simple. They say that everyone's voices matter. So all on Parler are equal regardless of race, age, religion, politics, or dietary choices. Um, I don't know if that includes pineapple pizza, but yeah, you, it's not just like a conservative platform. It's just a, it's a platform for people who value free speech. So go check them out by clicking the link in the description below, and I'll see you over there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Welcome back. Uh, we got some questions from our local supporters, and then we'll take questions from the chat. If you're if you're in the chat, are you still doing videos with Ascension Presents? Yes. Cool. Yeah, we do them every other week. Nice. Yeah. And you're doing your own podcast now. Yeah, we just started a podcast called Conversations with Jackie and Bobby. How cool! And let me check it out. Is there a website or what is it? Yeah, uh, our website is JackieandBobby dot com. Okay. And then is it J A C J A C K I E? Oh yeah, there it is. It's funny, Jackie. Oh and, my gosh, you guys look so great. Oh, you're so sweet. Thanks. Uh, Jackie and Bobby <laughs> are both interchangeable men and women's names. Ah, like Jackie yes. Chan, Jackie <laughs> Robinson, and then you have Bobby, like Bobby. Bobby what? Well, I know I know a few Bobbies <laughs> who are latest, you know, with okay. an IE, yeah. like the Bobby yeah. with an IE. So, 
So we it's will. Kind of funny. Okay, but there you go. Jackie and Bobby.com. Link is in the description, Neil, below. Yeah. Uh, go check you guys out. That's awesome. So the podcast is conversation. It's like a, it's also a YouTube podcast. And then if you YouTube. subscribe to them on Patreon, you get their special podcast where they each take three shots of whiskey before recording. <laughs> Isn't that right? You said that? Sure. Uh huh. <laughs> yep. That's what we said. Oh, my gosh. That's oh, so funny. Oh, man. Or you just get a sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. The first People like their cooler. stickers. You're like, I'll pay $10 a month for a sticker. Uh -huh. Oh, my okay. gosh. Okay. We'll talk about accents. Accents. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, so dear. I have family from Wisconsin, you know? And so sometimes I just start doing that, you know? I don't know where it um, comes from. Actually, that started sounding like Buffalo. Like one time I was in Buffalo and they said salad. Yeah, I want a salad. Like a waitress, I was like, salad? Oh. Yeah. You know? There's a woman here in Subinville. I go and I buy something. I don't want to say where she's from because I don't want to out her or make her feel bad. But the way she <laughs> says thank you yeah. really annoys me. Uh, how does she say? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Something like that. Sounds like she's a, like a valley girl. Is thank that what that is? Thank I, you. Like, oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you. I'm like, why are you <laughs> saying you? Here's the other thing that bothers me, and I'm sure I have done it, mm -hmm. is when you say goodbye to someone on the phone. Like, All right, see you. And they go, mm-hmm. Yeah, bye. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, you don't bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a thing people do, right? Bye. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? The, yeah, the they, tag, right? 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 You know? Right? I do the, do the tag thing, you know? Yeah. Well, that's not bad, though. You that know? doesn't annoy right? me. Neil, anything, any annoying? Oh, um, <laughs> oh, here we go. I, I had a lady at church who would say far instead of fire. She would say far and instead of desire, she would say desire. Desire. So when she would lecture at church, the, the far of the Lord. <laughs> was was like, it a southern kind no, of? No, it wasn't even uh, like the far. I was like fire, fire. What's, what's some of your pet peeves? And you can, you can feel free to jump in. In like talking? Just life, everything. Oh, Lord. I've got one that's going to offend all of my friends. I definitely have pet peeves. One of my biggest pet peeves is driving. Like, and in, in when people are in the fast lane and they are not passing, the, per it's like the point of this lane is to Let be- Let me remind you. Is to be passing. I wish I had a sign that was like, because it, there are literally signs that said, tra slower traffic, keep yeah. right. Yeah. And oh, it, it bothers Kills me you. to high heaven when people are in Those the Those magnets lane. on the back of cars that say, who saved who? Nobody. Nobody saved anybody. Wait, what? You know the animal footprint who saved who? Like you rescued a dog. No, you, no one rescued anybody. <laughs> unless you drag them out of a burning building. I've never seen they, that. Oh, that bothers me. Also, uh, when people chew their ice. God, I oh, hate that so much. Mine's, mine are perpetual snifflers. <laughs> oh, the chewing of the icing. Let's go back to that. Because sometimes <laughs> I'll think to, I think to myself, I thought you were a decent person. <laughs> and then they'll drink and they'll... <laughs> They'll chew their ice in front of me. Mine is people go to the bathroom and chew it. <laughs> Chewing with their mouth out. open or God. In yeah. Hell. Like literally I had a friend in high school. He was a really good friend of mine and he thought maybe I liked this other dude. <laughs> and then he saw the guy eat a salad, a, a salad. And he was like, oh no, you could never. Cause I, uh. so by the way, so I have very sensitive ears. And when I read St. Therese of Lisieux's story of a soul, she talks about that. Seriously. She talks about that. She, she goes, does, yeah, she, there's a part I'm like, she's like, I have very sensitive ears. I'm like, oh, me too, me too. And she's like, and there was a nun behind me clicking her beads. And I'm like, oh, I get annoyed by that too, Therese. Yeah. You know, I think I was like 19 or 20 reading this book and she was 24 when she died. So I thought I have time yes. to be as holy <laughs> as Therese. Yes, you do. And she goes, and I wanted to turn around with all all my might and look at this sister. And I was like, oh, how I feel beautiful that. is it? I feel that. And then she, this is where we depart. Okay. She goes, <laughs> this is where we depart. She goes, I didn't slap her. And then I listened to the noise intently and made it as if it was a chorus to Jesus. And I'm like, <laughs> you've lost me. Therese. Yeah. You've lost me a woman, you know? You're, Cause I'm like, I, I yeah, can hear people's watches ticking me. two pews ahead of me. Yeah. That's how now sensitive ears. Anyone else? It's like, it's a good, it's a curse and a blessing. It's a blessing because musically you can hear harmonies, you can hear accents, all those good things, but then you can hear everything. You can hear, like, I will literally be in a crowded place, like a church, and be like, Bobby, do you hear that person going? I hate the sniffle thing. I'm like, I'm just so blow your nose. I'm so offended by it. <laughs> like, if I'm in adoration and someone's sniffling, I'm like, you know that this is an inordinate amount of sniffling. Well, Go just, away. Go you, somewhere else. Do you not hear how quiet it is? And that the one thing is, <laughs> or when, when people are praying the rosary but they're whispering it oh i hate that oh matthew i hate 
Yeah. <laughs> this the S sound. Oh, <laughs> the little whistle. Oh, oh, the whistle, the S whistle. I, yes. Don't even. So all these noise. I'm like, Lord, time off purgatory, please. Time off purgatory. But if, if we were to have a drink right now and I was chewing my ice, that wouldn't bother you. I don't mind the chewing ice because I don't mind the crunching sound as much as like the wet slap. Oh. <laughs> I don't think people who chew their ice should be able to vote. <laughs> it was a vote. No, I the chewing gum, the yeah. Oh lord! I think during my SATs there was a sniffler, and I was like, "Dear baby Jesus, the sniffler." <gasps> yeah, it's like just blow your nose. So yeah, you've gotten me. I have pet peeves on driving for sure, and then I have like sound. Here's another thing that bothers me, peeves. and it's one of these things that I think is so unique that will alienate alienate ninety percent of my audience. Oh no! I don't know why anybody would leave their phone on such that it bings when they get a text message. That mm. pierces me off. I, bing, bing, bing. <sighs> Just put it on vibrate. Yeah. Put it in your pocket. <laughs> I hate that. I, Does you, do you really? Is that a thing? Yeah. You don't like that either? No, I, no, I. Oh, I was expecting I had both this, of you to disagree. No, me. I had this happen recently. <laughs> that a woman, it was like. Just get on the phone and call the guy. She literally was leaving voice and then it would bing and she would do it. She literally did it for 20 minutes straight in the airport. I was like, oh my gosh, just call him. Because she was voice texting with her. Yes. <laughs> was, ding. Ding. And it's, <laughs> it interrupts the family life too. If <laughs> yeah. someone comes in and there's just this constant binging. Oh my, my gosh. Yeah, my phone's on just silent or vibrate or whatever. But that's, that's, here's, here's another question. Yeah. Have we gotten to the point in society where it's okay to sit in a public place and listen without earphones to a video? Is that the kind of society we're living in, Jackie? Wait, like you're pro listening? No, oh, I'm not. Thank you. But, but everyone does that now. Okay. And even on an airplane, people do that. What is that? I, I don't understand. I'm, I'm like, so bothered by I'm it. I'm like, do I, like, do I call the flight attendant? I've actually given someone earphones before. I've actually, <laughs> like, in an airplane, yeah. someone was listening to something, and I pretended that I tried to give the person the benefit of the doubt. Maybe yeah. they don't have it. I'm like, hey, did you, did you want these for right. free? Right. And at that point- It's like when you hand them a tissue. Oh, yeah. Do you, did you, you sure? have a tissue? Yeah. Do you want to blow your nose? Or you're like, here's $10 <laughs> to Starbucks. Do you want to leave the vicinity? Oh, my gosh. But, no, I've I've had people on a couple flights recently where they're listening to their movie without- <laughs> 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 this is, I feel like I'm becoming uh, that fella from Curb Your Enthusiasm. But yeah. granted, I have headphones because I am a grown adult. I, that's another pet peeve is when people get mad at babies on planes. Ugh. Okay, right. Because I've, I've had four children and I'm like, yeah. you are a grown adult. Yes. You should have brought headphones with you. Like today I had a screaming toddler behind me. But who cares? I had headphones because yeah. I'm a grown adult. And also that before. child is incapable of controlling their emotions and crying. Right. You as an adult are capable of not chewing your eyes in front of my face <laughs> or sniffing every five seconds <laughs> or listening to that YouTube video. You know, I don't mind when toddlers are toddlers, but I mind no. when adults are toddlers. I yes, mean, that, yeah, that's so, it. That's me. it. Make adults, make toddlers, make adults, adults again. <laughs> Make Istanbul, Constantinople again. Okay. <laughs> Avi, can I take questions? Or yes, do you want to sure. say? Do you want to say more about Jackie and Bobby.com? Jackie and Bobby. Okay. Here's what I wanted to say. Yes. And then you can do another pitch. Okay. Speaking of accents. Yeah. All right. I once met a woman in Canada who had not yet realized I was Australian because we were just meeting. Okay. And she introduced herself as, I'm going to do it in American accent, B-A-R-B, like Barbara. Barb. Right. Yeah. But when I say that word, it sounds like this, Bob. Bob. It sounds like how you say B O B. Right. Like if someone's called B O like Bob Lesnowski, Bob. Bob. But the way I say Barb is Barb. Bob. So she's like, hey there, I'm Barb. I'm like, g'day, Bob. She's like, no, not Bob. Barb. Yeah, I know, I can't do that. <laughs> but the R is like my other Australian. I only have two Australian friends, maybe three, four. Um, but I'm like, say your like say summer. And you go, like, summer. Because it's summer. Here, summer. let me try. Let me see what it is. Summer. Summer. Is that, that was my American accent. That was pretty good. It don't lie to me, though. Summer. What did you, what is it? I know what you did but last. I know what you summer, did last summer. Beer. 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 Summer. Whatever. <sighs> awesome. What a great podcast. Totally awesome. Quines with Aquinas. But honestly, Jackie and Bobby. So what are you doing? A video podcast or what? Yes. Where we interview people. Um, we just like human formation, you know? Like we like interviewing people like psychologists. Nice. I want to interview like napro surgeons, nice. just things that people yeah. 
just human formation, things that like, even if a non-Catholic stumbled upon the podcast, they would be like, wow, or just people with amazing testimonies. Like I know a few people who are miracles that have been sent to the Vatican for the canonization of saints. And so I love those kind of beautiful testimony stories um, that are inspiring and, or just very human, like Catholic psychologists. And I love like NAPRO, NAPRO yeah. technology and surgeons and people. I'm like, oh, I wish the world could know more about yes, this. So. You're very, you and my wife are similar in that regard. Yes. She's very passionate about this. Yes. And that's because she had endometriosis. Right. She had doctors trying to put her on the pill. Yeah. And then she oh, realized. Give me talking about that, brother. I could just talk about that. Well, let's do it. Maybe there'll be a question about it. And okay. that will be your cue All right. to talk right. for an hour. Avi says, are Jackie and Bobby still involved with the Word on Fire Institute? You used to work for them, right? Yeah, we worked for them about a year and a half. And <laughs> then in May, we we quit and we are just doing our own thing. So, yeah. uh, Liz Leonard says, any advice or practices to challenge and grow in marital relationship? That's a very broad question, Liz. Any advice on yeah. practices to challenge and grow? One thing my wife and I used to do when we had like zero money for date nights is go to Costco and eat samples. Oh my gosh, I love it. That's yeah, great. that's what we did. That was our date night. And I think we learned that we actually learned that from Annie and Kana Hickman. That is hilarious. But that would be one thing I would say is like carving out a date night every single week. And if you can't go out and you have kids having a date night at home, but finding it a way to make it like to set it apart. Yeah. This Wofford said when they were really when they were really poor, didn't have very much money, they would every few months go to Olive Garden and split a tour to Italy sampler and then get extra bread sticks That's and salad. That's amazing. Because yeah. <laughs> they didn't have very much money. Yes. So I would say if you can pray with your spouse or if you like reading with your spouse, that for me, Bobby and I, we really like growing intellectually together. We like doing novenas together. We like reading books. So um, even devotionals like Bobby and I, Hey, Hey there, plug for the book. Bobby and I wrote a book called forever, a Catholic devotional Shut for your, your marriage. Face. Shut for it. Your marriage. Did and it just come out? No, it came out a few years ago, but it's no. a, it's like a six week devotional for you and your spouse. Oh yes. I've seen this. And one. it's like literally a little 500 word blurb per day with some questions to ask each other or like a uh, prayer to pray together or exercise, nice. they like go, yeah, stare each other in the face for Three minutes and see what <laughs> see who wins. <laughs> see if you could keep your note. I've been thinking that a cool <clears throat> book to put together would be a book with short excerpts from great authors and thinkers that are designed for date nights. So oh, like that would be maybe cool. we can't read the entire of the brothers Karamazov together, but like maybe there's this section that has a little introduction and a little outro that we can read in like fifteen minutes and just feel pleased about ourselves that we did something other than watch The Office again. Hey, I, we would do it. That yeah, I love I love being able to talk with Bobby about intellectual things because we're normally well, oh, he reads a ton. Like I thought I read a lot, and he reads just a ridiculous amount a week, whatever. So okay. I'm always asking him like, "What are you? What are you reading?" And he gives me little things. And yeah, but we love having those ways that we can grow together intellectually, spiritually, having fun together, playing fun, together. Yeah, yeah, finding yeah. Like Bobby and I went axe throwing because we live in Texas That's now. Amazing. So yes. axe throwing was one of our, it was like a bowling alley, but <laughs> yes. they have like a bulls, like a. <laughs> yes. Of course, my wife has EDS. So if she would have thrown an axe, I think she would dislocate her entire oh, gosh. arm. Yeah. But, yeah. So you know, we can do other things. No like axe throwing with Cameron. Yeah. Sitting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, 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 we've created this space in our room with like two comfortable chairs and a little like footstool thing. Mm -hmm. And so it was nice last night to kind of get the kids to bed early and just to have a drink and to sit down and just be together. Yeah. It's so lovely. That, but mean, you, you have to fight for that time. Yeah. That, that's why Bobby and I were very <laughs> adamant on like, we want to make sure our kids have a bedtime because yes. we want our alone time. Because your marriage is more important than your relationship with them in that they and, came from your marriage and they'll yeah. be sustained by your marriage and they need you to be well. Yeah. And so prioritizing your spouse. Right. Not it, to the neglect of your children. Right. But prioritizing your spouse. In whatever way that, yeah, yeah. And however you can do that. Yep. No shame. But do it. Or else no you're a bad parent. <laughs> Michael bad parent. Vielma says, what are proper <laughs> expectations for kids in mass? <laughs> I have a two-month-old, two-year-old, and a four-year-old. Good luck. Aww. He's like, I feel like mass is always a mess. Yeah. How do I make them behave perfectly? LOL. LOL. You don't. Um, especially not before the age of reason. They are unreasonable creatures. You cannot reason with them. So I love it. Really, 
when you go to the back of a church, like if you are at a, like I'm at a massive parish that has 8,000 families. When uh-huh. you go to the back, it is all the kids who are between one and three. They are all, all squirrels. It's like the squirrel, squirrels in the back. So between one and three, it's just really rough. So just hang in there. Like literally you, <laughs> as they get older, um, maybe around four, four and a half, like our four, he's four and a half year old. He can sit, he can sit fine in mass. Um, but even our older girls, like I have my oldest as a sanguine, she's like a little squirrel still. So she kind of is always looking around and I'm like, ah, you know, I'm always like, Abby, let's just put your hands. I just, I almost like tell her to do this just so she does something with her hands, you know, cause she's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. The, the second one, the six and a half year old is almost, she's more chill. And so it's actually a little easier for her to sit still. So just God bless you if you have kids under the age of reason. That is a tough age. And right now they're un- outnumbered. It's like three who are all under yeah. that age. But it's- I think not expecting your children to act like adults yeah. and being okay with them. Because I think part of the frustration we parents feel towards our children is how they make us feel about ourselves and how we're parenting them. Right. So if my ch- child acts in such a way that I uh, feel like a failure... I don't like feeling like a failure. Right. And when I feel like a failure, I might get angry about feeling like a failure right. and then direct that at this beautiful little child. Yeah. So one piece of advice that old Matt Frad would give to young dad Matt Frad would be like, it's 100% okay to like just walk outside with the kids for like most of the mass. Show for, for the years. homily For years. 100%. <sighs> it would be way better for you to consistently go to liturgy with your children unless you may not want to go. I mean, I, okay, let me rephrase that. Like it might be the case... I mean, the catechism says this at some place that I, I was just trying to find, but I couldn't, that these different reasons that you're not obligated to go to Sunday Mass. And one of the things it says is taking care of small children. Mm. So there's that. But that it would be better for you to go consistently to Holy Mass and to be chill about it than for you to go. And every time you go, mom's angry or dad's angry. <laughs> right. No one likes to be angry. And so you probably won't persist in going to Sunday mass. You might just give up altogether or it'll be an altogether unenjoyable experience for your children. So just go easy on yourself. Breathe. Yeah. All is well. Take them downstairs. Take them outside. And they're not the the ch- children are not required to go until they receive. There's communion. that too. So I there have been times when I have gone and then Bobby's gone. I mean, that's not ideal, but when you're out, no, I will say at we, when we were in that stage and we sat in a pew and one kid had to be taken out because they were screaming and then another kid had to be taken out. Essentially, I can't just leave my third child, right. my four-year-old. They have to all come out too and then people take your seats. I mean, it's just, it's chaotic, you guys. I And it's so it's so nice when we have communities that actually help us. Like when we've had people at a church that are sitting around us, like we literally can pass our babies to that because we know them. That has been glorious, but that is not the case so many times. Yep. So yeah, take it. They're, they're kids and they're they're going to be that way. So I, I would just, the only, the advice I would give is like, yeah, you can have some little mass books or things that are. Okay, um, I found the line here, but you finish your sentence. Yeah, there. I would just say there's little things that you can bring, but literally our two and a half year old, it doesn't matter how much stuff you bring. She's going to lose her, her poop. Yeah. Like, she screams. So in paragraph 2181 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says the Sunday Eucharist is the foundation and confirmation of all Christian practice. For this reason, the faithful are obliged to participate in the Eucharist on days of obligation unless excused for a serious reason. And then it gives examples and it says illness, the care of infants is an example it gives. Mm. So I wish I kind of knew that too. Like if I kind of woke up and my kid is in a particularly awful mood. Or maybe ha- like it's like okay, like maybe we decide as a family we're going to stay home today, and mum will go or dad will go, and we'll pray. The other thing is, if you lower your expectations about what your kids should get from Holy Mass, like if all they get after you've kept them up the back for the majority of Holy Mass is they got to light a candle and like bless themselves with holy water, like that's a beautiful thing. The other thing I, a friend of mine told me, and I this stuck with me was to prep them for Mass too. Yeah. No, again, when they're really little, it's a little more difficult. Um, but before we go in, I always say, why do we go to Mass? And they, my 
my six-year-old, eight-year-old, and the four, almost five-year-old, they're like, because we're going to say thank you to Jesus. Why are we saying thank you to Jesus? For dying on the cross for us. And mm-hmm. why did he do that? To save us from our sins. And why did he do that? Because he wants to be in heaven with us for all mm-hmm. eternity. That's right. So, and I am like, now is mass a jungle gym? Is it a playground? No. <laughs> so I just have to remind the purpose. Like, why yeah. are we here? And we're not here to be entertained. We're here for Jesus because we're saying thank you for yeah, his sacrifice. That's good. So just a reminder, like, okay. I like that. It's like the little prep, like the, yeah. the, the prep talk before we go into church. I like that. Why we're here. And and I think like parents might feel obligated to help their children understand every aspect of the liturgy, which, hello, you don't either. So right. just chilling out. Just chill. Just and take them. Just let let the routine of going to Holy Mass be the education. And like mom and dad being gentle with you and each other. Anyway. And more is caught than taught. Right. Yeah. They see mom and dad praying. They and, see, and your community, your friends, yes. you know, your neighbors. Who are there. So just my advice be hang in there. Like yeah. you, they're not going to be perfect. They're kids. MT Nun says, Matt Frad, you guys are cracking me up. More serious question. Any advice on navigating raising teens when spouse is not a practicing Catholic? Mm, that's hard. It is hard. You have teen. Do you, are you have almost teenagers? I have a 14 year old and a 13 year old. So yes. Oh yeah. You have yeah. teens. Yeah. yeah, but it, but I am a Catholic and so is my wife. Yeah, gosh, I, I can't imagine. I, I don't know how to speak to this. I would love to have somebody on the show who can address this issue because I know people who maybe converted to Catholicism after right. they got married and their spouse isn't, and that is a source of, of great difficulty. But I would say, like, the Lord is king and we can abandon all to him. And we can say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my marriage and my family to you and the difficulties in my marriage that I want to fix in my own way. But instead, I surrender it to you for you to do with us, with it, according to what, however you want to. But bring more good out of this, you know, than than, or bring good out of the things that I feel like I'm failing at, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I just heard a mom give a talk about this, actually. She she had her conversion when her, her sons were teens Mm -hmm. and, and she wasn't even Catholic. So she converted, she became Christian. She was reading her Bible. And at this point, some of her sons were like, Oh my gosh, mom, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and they were growing up, I think kind of atheist. And then she, her one son finally started kind of reading the Bible and was becoming Protestant and Mm. she became Catholic. And then he was arguing with her about all that stuff. Interesting. She just prayer. uh, We, yeah. And giving it to the Lord, but being an example because, and not, um, I I would say just offering them in the invitation, offering them encounters with Jesus. I mean, you are still their parent. They are teenagers. They are still under your roof. Right. So one praying is, (laughs) massive um being an example of love and then just the invitation like probably asking your spouse to at least not contradict me right like even if you can't get on board with this could you could you at least not yeah you can still have great conversations with teens you can still invite them to like hey there's a retreat at i mean you're still their you know mom um and i would just say find opportunities for them to encounter the lord but yeah prayer man and saint monica St. Monica. Mm. I keep going back to this line from Jacques Philippe in his book about peace, where he says, prior to becoming Christian, we often want the wrong thing in the wrong way. Then we become Christians. We now want the right thing, but we often want the right thing in the wrong way. Mm. We're sort of fretful and anxious about our children being holy or our spouse being a certain way or ourselves being a certain way. Instead of looking upon them and us with the same patience that our Lord looks upon us with. And so what we want to do is abandon all this to our blessed Lord who loves us more than we do. And want the right thing in the right way, this sort of peaceful way. Because right. as Jacques Philippe says, and he's spot on, there is never a good reason to lose your peace. All the reasons we offer to lose our peace are bad reasons, period, the end, no exceptions. Um, and that takes a lot of faith, especially when things seem to be unraveling, having to stand there and trusting in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. I help, says Caleb, teach my parish's marriage prep classes. What is mm-hmm. the best advice for engaged couples? Go. Ooh. <laughs> 200 words <laughs> the on best, this. I know, right? Like <laughs> yeah. five words. Yeah. Best advice for engaged couples. Hmm. I mean, I'm trying to think. When Bobby and I were engaged, we asked married couples the same thing. Like, what would be your best advice for us? I had I had multiple different answers. So I'm trying to think. I don't, there's not just one piece of advice. Like, is there one that comes <clears throat> immediately yeah. to you? Like what's I mean, the best piece of the advice? The only for- way to give a best piece of advice for engaged couples is to be so general as to be completely unhelpful, which is namely 
the two of you should love Jesus Christ and treat your relationship with him more importantly than you do with each other. Yeah, I would say that. And then I would say communication. It's, it's massively important to learn how to communicate well, like learn how to fight well. Yes. Learn how to commute like every part of marriage I mean, this is a person you are going to be the most intimate with. You have to be able to communicate even about those most intimate things. Mm-hmm. And if you can't, oh, it's it's going to be rough. Conflict resolutions were huge for us. Huge. You have to learn how to argue. Yeah. You have to learn how to be able to bring up difficult things. So that would be, yeah, after loving Jesus and loving like only even the man of your dreams, the woman of your dreams is still not God. They're still not going to satisfy every desire of your heart. Only God mm-hmm. can do that. The second thing would be like, you have to learn how to communicate. That's always like the number one thing. Pe- reason people get divorced is like, they don't communicate and 20 years goes by and they grow in resentment. And then they get yeah. like one person like, I don't want to do this anymore. So to the point of conflict resolutions, my wife and I both served on net ministries. And that's where I learned how to, were you on net? No, oh. but a friend of mine told me that <laughs> your guys is how you guys do it. So explain. Oh, interesting. Cause I probably only know like a little piece of it. But. Yeah. Well, it's quite simple. Often when we say sorry to each other in everyday mm-hmm. life, we say, Hey, sorry about that. And the other person says, it's fine. Don't worry about it. But it's, it's not fine. And <laughs> I am worrying about it, which is why we're discussing it. Yeah. So my wife and I have the language and have since the beginning of, Hey, when you did this, I felt this. So I, it, I thought you were saying this. This is how I took it. Um, and then the, the other person, if they've committed some fault, says, okay, please forgive me. And then you say, I forgive you. And that language feels really clunky and foreign at first. Yeah. But it's really important that we say, please forgive me. I forgive you. Not Please forgive me. It's fine. No, it's not fine. That's why I'm asking your forgiveness. Yeah, That's really important. Also, I think it's really important to not use um, kind of absolute statements like you always do this. So every time we do that, because right. that's not true. Like you don't actually always do this. <laughs> like there's times, like at least when you're sleeping, that you don't do that. Yeah. So being kind of modest in our critiques and using that language of forgiveness has been huge enough. But when you say, I felt, they can't say, no, you didn't. Yeah. It's like, no, I felt this way when you said this or when you did this. And then Bobby and I also do the, now you you, you can't change the past. So we, it helps us to say like, in the future, it would really help me yes. if you did this. Yes, yes, So yes. in the future, like, I know we can't change what we just did or you just did or I just did, but in the future, it would really help me if yes. this. That has been really helpful. That's really good. Language like. Especially because as you referenced earlier, we all have different love languages. We right. receive things differently. So you might, you might even be admitting that, okay, this is a fault on my part. So it would help me if you would do it this way because I would receive it better. Like maybe I should be able to receive it in the way you're doing it, right. but I'm finding it difficult to. So since you love me and since we want these things to go more smoothly, if you could do this, that would help. Like Bobby, but one of our things, like Bobby's like, it would in the future, before you criticize me, it would help me if you said thank you. Yeah. Like, thank you for doing the dishes. Yeah. But could you also, <laughs> <laughs> like, he, he's like, I don't care if you like give me correction or, crit- but like, just acknowledge that what I'm, yeah. what I'm doing for you. Yeah. Say thank you. Like, cause one of our fights that we always talk about, I was like, he was mowing the lawn and blow- and I was like, babe, there's leaves all over. And he was just mad and like gave yeah. me silent treatment, whatever. And nice. he's like, nice okay, melancholic the- tactic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I do the silent treatment too. So I don't say oh. anything that okay. I wanted to not take that, you know, be able to take back. Um, uh-huh. But to be like in the future, like acknowledge what I did and say thank you. And then say, and by the way, could you also mm-hmm. do this? So that's how we just say in the future, could this yeah, would really help me. I like me. that. I think another thing that my wife and I have found helpful is to say like, I've said to my wife, like, what can I do that when I do it, you feel loved by it? Yeah. Because I'm a massive words of affirmation guy. Yeah. My wife doesn't care. So when I'm like, honey, you are gorgeous. <laughs> She's like, thank you. She doesn't care. I may have well have said care. like the stove is black. What's uh-huh. her love language? Her love language is acts of. Uh, I think it's quality time and acts of service. Acts of service. So when you so like the when other you day, mop the floor, she's I like, put oh. together a little shoe rack of hers. Oh. You know, in a car, I just put it together and put her shoes on. I went, hey, I did this, and she's like, oh my god, like she felt like, very loved I love by you that. So much, Trina. Whereas for mm, me, yeah. it's it's definitely physical touch. So if like we're driving and she'll touch my neck or touch my hand, I feel very affirmed. Very, Words very, of affirmation. Yes, 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 yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. But that's very interesting because the way we give love isn't necessarily the way our spouse receives it. That's right. Liz says, was curious if she, Jackie, knows Leah Darrow. I know she went through a miscarriage within the past year. Ja- Did she, Leah? Yeah. Oh. Both, both, yeah. Both of us have very... I'm sorry. Yeah. She says, any advice on navigating that experience? 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, both Leah and I, like I was in September, I think she was in January or February and we both had bl- like a lot of blood loss and had to go to the hospital and like, I had to get a blood transfusion Oh my! because of, it was crazy. Um, so I would say for me, I know a lot of women, it, it's, you have to process the, just like any kind of grief, you process the grief. Um, it's really good to be able to talk like talk about it and um hopefully you have community that you can process that with um we named our baby like that all uh, our babies actually had three miscarriages in a year so we named Mm. all of our babies um and yeah for me i some women really have a hard time and they really blame themselves like for me i'm like a i i didn't do that but i'm like okay i need to know what's going on my body then because i know like this didn't just, just happen, right? Like there's something going on. That's to me, like I want to get to the root of it, right? And so for me, like I went to a doctor, got blood work done, found out I had a thyroid, like my thyroid, like hyperthyroid. I thought it was hypo and it's hyperthyroid. And so having a doctor who's like a functional medicine doctor, who, by the way, most doctors will not do a full thyroid panel. They do not do your hormonal panel. Having a doctor who's like either a naturopathic doctor, a napro doctor, or functional medicine, they will do a full thyroid panel. They will do a full full hormonal panel. And then they're the kind of doctors who also like help you, whether it's a diet change or um, whether it's like getting medication to help your thyroid or whatever it is. But so f- there are resources like for women who've had miscarriages and um, of like how to process that, especially because sometimes the husband's it's hard. It's hard. Sometimes husbands do have a hard time and sometimes they don't. I wanted to bring that up. Uh, let me just kind of insert this here. So my yeah. wife's had two miscarriages. Mm-hmm. Emotionally, I felt very little. Right. I felt sad for my wife, who I love and see right. that she's in pain and wanted to comfort her. But as far as the loss of our children, who were both um, you know, very early stages of pregnancy, like several weeks, yeah, I, I didn't feel anything. And I, I suspect that it's not a good idea to berate myself for not feeling something because, of course, feelings, we can't judge ourselves based on right. our feelings. Yeah. Because then, yeah, it's hard because then you kind of feel bad. Like, why don't I feel yeah. bad? Like, I just never went down that road because I know yeah. that intellectually people can process things differently and that's okay. And then some men kind of go the are do have a really hard time and nobody asks them, asks them how they're doing. Oh, so yeah. yeah, it's kind of, we had a, um, like a, a miscarriage resource book of like how to process the grief of losing a child because everybody processes it differently. And, and then, yeah, if you are able to talk about it, do you have community? Are you able to talk about it with your spouse? So, mm. um, because yeah, Bobby, it, same thing like he hadn't even seen an ultrasound right. yet so it was hard like i'm not as connected mm-hmm. and then you feel you kind of beat yourself up over that for like i i don't feel as yeah. it's just hard like intellectually it's very sad that, and you feel bad the thing for the wife. i don't think i f- would say i felt guilt but the thing i felt conflicted about was i want to experience what you're experiencing because right. right. i know you my wife are experiencing pain i want to I, I want to feel that with you so i can go through this with you but i didn't feel that Right. I just felt bad for her. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then I will say it is also possible to have postpartum when you miscarry to have postpartum depression, postpartum. I had a lot of anxiety. So Hmm. my functional medicine nurse, she gave me, she had me go on bioidentical progesterone, which like immediately helped. Like Bobby was like, you like came out of a cloud. He's like, you had like a cloud of just you weren't yourself. Like you weren't, you lost all the color of your life. Like you weren't motivated. And I read that like progesterone is like the um, calming hormone. Okay. And so when you, there was a lot of anxiety, where it's like, it was amazing how taking, just having some progesterone like helped a lot. It was, it was like, it was like a cloud lifted. Wow. I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like back to myself. So also kind of paying attention to the physical hmm. signs of what's going on. Just because Leah Darrow was mentioned, I just want to say I love her. Yeah. I just have such affection for that woman. She's so good. Yeah. And she's fun. And sassy. Fun. Awesome. Yeah. What's she doing these days? I haven't been in touch with her forever. Dude, they have a farm. (laughs) She's living the farm. She is living the farm life. There's got to be a significant percentage of Catholics who now are doing the farm life thing. Hmm. 
Oh yeah. Well, I want to do the farm life thing. I I'm do like, not I need at a, all. You don't? <laughs> no, not at all. Super happy to live on a street where occasionally we hear gunshots. Oh, Next, where we hear gunshots. I'm actually like, at least he's like a backyard <laughs> garden. Maybe get some chickens. You know? Yeah. Well, we oh, do. We gosh. do have that. We have bees. We're getting chickens. Do you I, really have bees? Yeah. Yeah. My son is a huge. He loves oh, bees. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. All so right. we just extracted our uh, full honey, and it was lovely. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give yeah. you a jar before you go. I don't think our HOA uh, will allow some uh-huh. chickens, but we'll just hide them back there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So they're on a farm. Good, 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 good. I'd love to be in touch with her. Her uh, and I started at Catholic Answers the same time. That's right. When? What, what year was that? 2012, I think. Okay. Okay. So we, when we, my wife and I arrived from Canada, she was out and so kindly gave us her apartment. Me, my wife, my two kids for like, I think it was a week or something. Oh my goodness. Yeah. She rocks. She does. All right, let's see. C. Louise says, I don't know if you have already talked about this, but I'd love to hear Matt and Jackie, two of my favorite online speakers, talk about Catholics fostering and adopting babies and children. I would love to see either of you interview Catholics or any Christians who may have done this within marriage, but also single Christian Catholics. So open up this vision for Catholic single people to do this too. To generally encourage and help others to consider this more often as possible and hopefully... Anyway. (gasps) Yes. I want to say this real quick. And then, okay. first of all, the word hero gets thrown around way too much. Way too much. Like, our <laughs> teachers are heroes. No, no, they're not. Stop. Unless they save someone, they're yeah. not. They're you, not. Shut up. They're not. Your definition is very small. Yes. But foster parents are heroes. Yeah. I just think. In fact, my wife just did a whole foster parent class this past weekend. Really? Yeah. So we're heroes. Suck it. No, we're not actually. <laughs> we haven't, haven't fostered anyone yet. But we, we're, we're really open to it. So really? we're, okay. just, we're going through this right now. And actually on our podcast, I have somebody who is a friend of mine who has fostered and fostered and adopted. And have you done this podcast already? No. And I so I have like a, a good Beautiful. list of people who I'm like are on the really close. Yep. Um, but yes, one of them is... I I have a lot of people in my life I'm like that are amazing and one one person I know has fostered like 12 they have 12 kids that they're fostering at the same time not just like oh they foster 12 kids no at the same time Glory. but I yes my friend who I want to interview she actually has spoken at her church her church and like I'm like could you imagine if like at every church they had someone who was a foster parent come up just for an announcement and say, hey, we have a hundred thousand kids in this diocese alone or in this state Mm -hmm. that need a foster parent. Can you imagine if every church, like one couple, one couple. I heard that we have 60,000 children in Ohio who who need to be. Right. I think in Florida is like a hundred thousand. It was like where my friend is like, there are a lot of kids. But you're right to have one couple. That's right. Can you imagine if one at every parish, one couple just said, was inspired by that. I mean, I, so yes, that is something that I am, I'm like very passionate about in the sense of like, I, I feel like some people, people just don't know. And all you need is a witness. Mm-hmm. Like, I just love people who are witnesses. And so I have quite a few friends who are witnesses of being adoptive parents and foster parents. And so when my one friend whom I'm thinking of, like, she's just, a, she and her husband are beautiful witnesses of that. And so I, I'm going to have her on the podcast soon. So good, glad you good. said that. Yeah. Yes. So well, out. again, Wait links in the description, subscribe to their channel and you will see yeah. that excellent episode. Good for you for doing that. Um, let's see. Dude Con, probably not his real name, says, father <laughs> of several tweens looking for advice for helping them discern between marriage and religious life. Is there a third option for committed Catholics? So there's consecrated life, which can go come out in religious life or single consecrated, like consecrated virgins. Or even I have a, one of my best friends. She is a... She's taken her first vows as a consecrated person who um, of the missionaries of Maximilian Kolbe. Mm. So they're not nuns. They are consecrated life. So you have the con- consecrated vocation, then you have the married vocation. Mm-hmm. So I have friends who are like consecrated virgins who took vows under the bishop in their diocese. And I have people who are mm. consecrated. So there's different in within the consecrated life. There's many different I ways, yeah. you know, or you could be a consecrated single person where you make a vow to mm-hmm. be single hardly for, for yeah. Jesus. Janet Smith, Dr. Janet Smith has done that. There you go. Yeah. I think for us, what's really important is just exposing our children to a lot of wonderful priests, nuns, and married people. Mm-hmm. And that really helps so that they can, you know, I, I didn't see a nun in a habit growing up. Me neither. And many of the priests that I knew growing up were much older and didn't wear the clerics either. So, 
move to Steubenville because they're everywhere. Yeah, but you're right. Just exposing the holy people. They're normal people. <laughs> yes. Normal there, we people. have priests over for dinner. We have our nun for like Sister Miriam when she comes over. We have, yeah. we want them to see all different yep. stages of life. Our six and a half year old, the little, my little red curly girl. She's ah, like, she's so beautiful. Dad, when is God going to bring me a man? <laughs> is that what she said? She did. That's so beautiful. Because she's like, mom, I want to be a mommy like you when I grow up. I'm like, you're going to be a better mommy than me when you grow up. She's yeah, just such she? a little, she, she's the kind, the heart, the sensitive heart that's like, I want to start a daycare. And she really thought she could, like could. So mm. she started getting everything ready for her, her daycare. I said, baby, I said, you know, you know, you have to be an adult, right? And she goes, no. She started crying. She really <laughs> oh. thought. Oh my gosh, this little sweetheart. So yeah. she other is, kids her age are selling lemonade stands. <laughs> well, her older <laughs> sister's like, I want to be a CEO. I'm going to be the boss of you. And she's like, I'm going to be a mommy, you know. So. Uh, yeah. I'll run the orphanage, yeah. maybe. <laughs> That's beautiful. Go. That's beautiful. Uh, Anka says, what an awesome guest. My question would be how to be a part of society that doesn't value nor respect family, women, men, chastity, and honesty, and how to bring up the children in such an environment. You know what? I will say, I... Thought, I, I thought Neil was laughing, but it was something he was touching. I'm like, that's not funny, Neil. <laughs> I actually think it's a benefit. It's it's almost like, I feel really grateful that we're growing up in a society or our kids are in this like kind of crazy because it's all out in the open. You know what I mean? Like, I know all the arrows the devil's throwing at us. So I, as a parent, am like, I'm ready to have conversations with my children about these things. Whereas mm -hmm. like in the past... Like it's like parent, hope they don't find out about it until yeah, they're 14. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. we're not going to talk about porn. We're not going to talk about sex. Mm. We're not going to talk about all this stuff, the like homosexuality and all this stuff. It's like, no, I know I'm going to have conversations with my children about all these things, like about abortion, about um, our, like they're, they've already seen people. They're like, is that a man or a woman? Like I'm going to have to. So I almost feel grateful as a parent that this is all out in the open. Like, it's not like, I hope they don't find out about it. You know what I mean? Like, I have to have these conversations. Why are you laughing? I'm so sorry. I don't know who said this. And you tell me how offensive this is on a okay, scale from okay, one okay, to okay. ten. Someone's like, you know who really loses in the transgender age? Manly looking women. Manly looking women? Why? I don't get it. Because, like, there are some women who might look a little more masculine. And you see them and now you're not sure. Whereas 20 oh. years ago, you were like, oh, yeah, it's a woman. And now you're like, I don't know. Might be a man wearing a yeah. dress. I don't know if that's... <laughs> I don't know. Sure. I don't know. We all lose, Matt. <laughs> I don't know. But there, well, we, were at a, we were at our kids' ballet class like years ago. And there was, there was a man with long hair. And they're like, Daddy, is that a man or a woman? <laughs> and and yeah. the guy was like smoking outside a bar. And so he kind of heard the comment and started laughing. Oh. <laughs> like, Good thing he started laughing. But uh -huh. he had long hair. And I had to tell my girls like... Guys can have long hair or short and hair, and, okay. and girls can have yes. short hair. Like, you know, we're not going to... Well, see, this is the point that we made earlier about fighting a bad idea with a bad idea is a bad idea. Because right. just because um, the transgender insanity, which it is, that lies to people and encourages us to go along with the lies, uh, might it, 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 it's, it makes men and women to stereotypes. Where it's like, if a girl likes soccer, well, maybe she's a bully and... Right. And then, then if you all of a sudden just say, we are, we are these stereotypes, yeah. you're not helping. Yeah. It's like, you're not But then helping. we fight the bad idea by saying, well, then, then girls cannot like that. And my girl won't like it. Right. You see what I mean? Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So just, yeah. just for the, the teens, um, I would say the best thing you can do is be com honest and vulnerable with your kid, like honest. And you as the parent are supposed to be the expert on these topics, because if you're not the expert, they will go to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I will say when I meet people who are like, I'm from a Catholic, a really Catholic family, like my family was so Catholic. And then they tell me like, but my sisters are no longer Catholic or my brothers. And I'm like, okay, but what's the, but I want to know why. And you know what it is most of the time. I'm like, but where did the peace, where, what happened? And the mm. one thing that most of the time is the case is their parents did not talk to them about sexuality and where there was shame around that. Mm. And so guess what? They had to go to the culture to find out anything about sex because their parents were too afraid and there was too much shame around it. They just didn't mention it. So what happens? They go look at porn and then mm. they sleep with their, now they're sleeping with their, it's like parents have to be the expert and it has to be something that's like just very yeah. Human formation. It's the human formation is so important. So actually the uh, Adam Young on the place we find ourselves, he actually has a podcast on 
the, like the puberty, like puberty talk, the talk talking about sex, facing your own sexual story, like yeah. how your parents, like when, when you don't talk about something that's so important, like sex, it fills it with shame yeah. automatically just by not saying anything about it. And uh, there's another book out that was saying like when people are raised with that idea of sex, the sh- then the shame behind it, they actually have less like their marriages are like less satisfying because yeah. they're like, they're st- that doesn't go away in marriage all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. So to me, that has always been like my kids when it's with age appropriate, whatever to, to see the beauty of the body, to see the beauty of their sexuality, mm-hmm. to see the beauty of, so like, I want to be a parent. I'm not, I don't want to be afraid of anything. Like I, they, like my little boy was like, mama, where does the baby come out? <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. like, well, the, my, the, the baby's in my uterus and then comes out the birth canal out my vagina. And then mm-hmm. the baby, and they're like, okay, you know? Yeah. Like and they, it's so important. I think that we use accurate terminology. Right. And they're not because, shamed. Yeah. It's like, you're the one who feels awkward, not your kid. And you don't need to push your awkwardness on your kid. So you can just have a frank conversation. And they can tell, and like, yeah, okay, even if cool. you use the correct terms, they can tell if you are embarrassed. They, they're very intuitive about body language, about how you say things. Yeah. And so there's a group called the Birds and the Bees, and they actually educate parents and parishes and moms and parishes, like how do, to talk about these kind of things without shame. And they're like, yeah, you are the expert on this topic mm-hmm. and you need to be the expert because or else your kids are going to go to other people to find the expert opinion. So now the, the thank you. That was really good. The, the question had to do with bringing up children in such an environment. I would also add that right. like, if it's possible to find a better environment, now there's no perfect environment. There's no right. Eden, right? We don't live uh, in Eden, but there are definitely better environments. So maybe consider that. I, I often think that finding a family in secular society, away from community and the sacraments and good Christian living, is like finding a children, a child in the woods. Imagine if you're walking through the woods and you just found a child. Mm-hmm. You're like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> if you don't find help, you will die. And yeah. I think that that's true of a family in a secular society without support. So that's why people should consider moving to Steubenville. <laughs> to Steubenville. <laughs> they really should. We just, just last night... We oh. had um, members of the Pittsburgh Symphony play a concert at Franciscan. The music was the most beautiful music mm. I've ever heard. It, you really see the difference between a professional and someone who's like really good at it. Right. Like huge right. difference. But we just came as a community and listened to this. And it doesn't have to be Steubenville. But like there's obviously great pockets of wonderful Catholics around the country. And if you're blessed enough to be able to have that mobility due to working from home or something like that, to seriously consider doing that. Yeah, you need community because then, especially when your kids are teenagers and start doing the eye rolling, like, oh, mom and dad, yeah. they have other people totally. in their life who they respect, who they're like, okay, it's not just mom and dad who are mm-hmm. like pushing these rules on me, you know? These other people um, are saying the same like thing Like this is kids. part yeah. of, yeah. So it's super important. There's a book called Brick by Brick by, I want to interview them as well, um, Andre and Angel Renier. So brick by oh, brick. I know them. Do you know Canada? Them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're awesome. They're anyways, and they wrote a book with their kids. Their seven kids Amazing. who are all missionaries, and their spouse, some of their spouses, who helped write the book too. Of like, how do you raise a a good Catholic family and keep them Catholic? And they kind of name those things. Like, you need good community. You need other people in your life. So that's a good book. Brick, brick by brick. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have a question here from Isabel. Ask her if she'll move to Steubenville. Will you move to Steubenville? Hey, let me tell you, (laughs) two years ago, I didn't know I was going to be in Dallas. So who knows? I feel like once God got me out of California, I feel like a missionary. Are you glad to be out of California? I mean, I miss the weather and the beach, but I am very grateful. I am very grateful for the community in Texas. Like we, Is it as crazy in California right now as people are saying? This mass exodus from the blue states. You have family in California. Are they talking about that? It depends what part you're in because i was in orange county Mm -hmm. and orange county is not los angeles gotcha and parts of orange county you really it it was it just depends where you live so yeah i mean there were parts of like in newport beach you wouldn't even know you're like is covid happening but then you would go in la and it was much different so it depends but i had a ton of friends leave california and go to texas florida georgia (laughs) idaho Maybe Steubenville, Nashville, wherever. I mean, they just were f- t- lo- tons of us lifelong Californians who never, ever thought we would leave left. So. I've met so many people who say they've moved to Steubenville because they heard me talking about it. No, they are you serious? 100% are you serious. Serious. 
swear to God, God this keeps them. happening to me. God bless them. And it's because I'm, I'm I, it's not, it's, it's not just because I'm like, hey, move to Super Bowl. It's because oh, I'm my. chatting with people who also live here yeah. and we talk about the community here. And I joke that there's going to be a lot of really angry people. Angered at me, in specifically in February. Oh. <laughs> a couple just moved here from Hawaii oh, with their kids. No, they didn't. They did. Oh, gosh. Okay, Bobby and I are at like, that point. I'm like, maybe we're gonna dial down the Steubenville talk yeah. on points with Aquinas. We're like, Lord, can you please let your will be below like a certain line of the United <laughs> States? Because we are both warm weathered. Yeah. Like he's a Florida boy. I'm a California. I'm like, Dallas is like the cold because it snows once, twice a year in mm-hmm, Dallas. Mm-hmm. And maybe not even that, but we just came the year of the freeze when the whole grid went down. Yep. So we don't know what a normal winter is like, but that is too cold. That That's like, yeah. you know, we're warm with him. Like, please, Lord, let your will be below a certain latitude. <laughs> or above a certain thermometer. <laughs> right, <line>. right. <laughs> ah, very good. I think we're done. Any more? I mean, we're done as far as questions. That was really abrasive. I mean, oh, I think we're done with those questions on locals. Do we have any questions on, uh, on the no chat? Super chats. No super chats. That's okay. We can we can ask their questions even if they don't pay us. Let's see. <laughs> Listeria. Uh, this is so lovely. I love Pints with Aquinas because I get to have such a diverse array of beautiful people like yourself. Oh, we talk about you. all sorts of different things. Yeah. You know, like apologetics and church history, and and then when your wife is in the room, we talk about you, your wife and I love to talk about crazy things. Oh so. my gosh! Yeah. Get us talking about relationships. Well, you got to be careful because she will try to get you on her show while you're here. And if <laughs> she you already do, did. She already who t- knows what will she come She already out. texted me and asked You two me. are very similar. <laughs> yeah. We have opinions, let me tell you. You do. We that do. good. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. I think that's it, guys. Thank you for being yeah. here, everybody. I want to let people know that we got two things coming up this week. Number one, we have a debate on purgatory this Thursday. And then on Saturday, we interviewed Dr. Peter Kraft in the Cigar Lounge, which will be oh. the shiznits, which I didn't know meant shit. Do you know it meant that? The shiznit? I, I said shiznits on a Steubenville stage once. I'm like, it'll be the shiznits. I don't know. I'm old. Well, I just repeat things people say. Bob Lesevsky's like, dude, only you could get away with that. I'm like, wait, what does it mean? Oh, I think I've said that. I mean, See, it's I like know. just another ter- another way of not saying it. <laughs> anyway, so we've got Peter Kraft coming on on Saturday. That's going to be an amazing conversation. Oh. Or it won't be. Either way, you should subscribe and click the bell because we are close to 300,000 subscribers. Oh and once we hit that, I will feel better about myself for at least five minutes and then we'll want to have 500,000 subscribers. So you can help that by clicking subscribe, clicking the bell button. Go and check out Bobby and Jackie's uh, podcast as well. Link is in the description to that below. Cool? Cool. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.